the whole yeah, thing. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More than half a nine. Okay, I'll call the uh, Lendary Planning Board meeting to order for <laughs> April 10th, 2013. And I want to point out, if we have an emergency, you need to evacuate. This room has two exits. They're on the right-hand side of the room uh, and of the audience. And if we need to evacuate, you have to proceed to the exit closest to you, move away from the building, uh, and don't come back into our fire officials have instructed everyone to do so. I guess we're going to please rise and pledge allegiance to the American flag. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Chris is uh, traveling. He's the only one that I know of that's not, not coming. And uh, I'll appoint Letha to uh, vote for Chris. And uh, I'll appoint uh, Maria to vote for uh, Scott until uh, he arrives. And actually, Laura. So uh, I'll have Al vote for Laura till she arrives. Okay. And gives us six voting members, uh, and actually seven with Mary now. And uh, we have a quorum. So first part of a meeting is administrative board work. The second part of a meeting is continued plans of uh, which it is Pillsbury Realty Development, uh, <coughs> due for March 27th. We'll go to administrative board work where we get our business done. And I just want to note that uh, John Vogel is sitting in for Cynthia May. Cynthia was unable to, uh, to make it tonight. We have one, two, actually three plans for signature, a voluntary merger, minutes of the 27th meeting, and uh, discussions with town staff. So, uh, hey, John. Oh, yeah. So we're getting eight voting members now. Sorry, we're on a little late. That's all right. Mr. Chairman, members John, of the you board. Got, um, Ms. Darlene's trial here. Yep, Ms. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, this plan was conditionally approved back on February 6th. Uh, it was a request of Darlene Cadero, the applicant. Um, the owner was Londonary Con Congregation of Jehovah Witnesses. The owner of Map 16, excuse me, Map 6, Lot 47 1, is for a formal review of a change of use site plan. <coughs> Again, the uh, plan was conditionally approved back in February. Staff can report conditions of approval have been met and recommend <coughs> signature of the plan. Mr. Chair, seeing that conditions have been met, I make a motion that we um, authorize the chair and secretary, secretary to, to sign the plans. I'll second the motion. Okay, motion by Mary, second by Lynn. Any discussion by the board? <coughs> seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Abstentions here with affirmative. And the uh, Ms. Darlene's child care plans will be signed at the conclusion of the meeting tonight. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, second plan for signatures for the Gennard subdivision, map 15, lot 110-5 at 2 Leland Circle, conditionally approved back in December of uh, 2011. Uh, staff can report conditions of approval that have been met and recommend signature of the plan. So moved. Okay. Second that. Motion by Mary, second by Lynn for the uh, Gennard subdivision uh, plants. Any discussion by the board. Seeing none, all those in favor of the saying aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. <coughs> Abstentions, Jeff's affirmative, and the uh, genetic subdivision plans will be signed at the conclusion of the meeting tonight. Third item for signature, Mr. Chairman, is a voluntary merger on behalf of uh, T-Mobile Bill uh, Raw Land, map 12, uh, lot 34, located at 28 Kelly Road. Uh, this is to correct an error on the tax map. Uh, tax map currently shows the... Uh, there's two lots, those being uh, 13 and 7 acres, and through the uh, additional research by the surveyor and the development of the property, it was determined that it was only a one, acre, uh, one lot uh, property, one piece of property. So again, this is a voluntary merger to correct an error on a tax map. Staff looked into it and are in agreement with the, the voluntary merger. You're, you're all set. Correct. That that voluntary merger art is in the read file for yeah, your signature. I, I got it. Uh, what the motion will be for the chair to sign the uh, notice of merger of parcels under RSA 674 colon 39-A. So moved. Second that, Mr. Chairman. Motion by Mary, second by Lynn. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Abstentions, chair is affirmative, and uh, I'll sign the uh, plans. Make sure I do it properly. Last set of plans for signature is a plan for a T-Mobile, again, Beale Raw Land, uh, map 12, lot 34. 28 Kelly Road. 
Uh, this was a request of the Beale Revocable Trust on the point communications for a site plan and conditional use permit to construct a 146 foot wireless communication facility and associated accessory equipment. Uh, this was conditionally approved back in April of 2011. Staff can report conditions of approval have been met and recommend signature of the plan. So moved. Seconded, Mr. Chairman. Okay, motion by Mary, second by Lynn for uh, signature plans of T-Mobile, Beale, Raw Land. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Abstention shows affirmative, and the uh, T-Beale, Raw Land will, plans will be signed at the conclusion of the meeting tonight. Uh, I have the minutes for the 27th meeting. Uh, make a motion to approve those. I'll make the motion to approve as amended. Okay. And I'll second that motion. Yeah, as amended. Mm -hmm. And seconds as amended. Any discussion by the board? John. All right, um, just one thing for the record. The, if I could call your attention to page 13 on uh, line uh, 35. Um, Cynthia May wanted me to point out the, the minutes are correct. It's an accurate representation of what happened. The question was asked if the town's existing zoning ordinances will be observed when developing the individual subdivision and site plans. The um, question that, should, that uh, should have been asked is will the town's uh, site and subdivision ordinances be observed when developing the individual subdivision and site plans? Uh, the answer to that question is yes. Um, but again, the uh, master plan PUD will be the de facto zoning ordinance for the, the properties. Okay, yes. so uh, just for the record, if we could add that statement, please. Okay, so that's correct in the minutes. Okay, uh, motion uh, by Mary, second by Lynn to uh, uh, accept the minutes of March 27th uh, as previously amended. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed to nay. Abstention, show us affirmative. No, I'm, I'm abstaining because I wasn't there. Okay, the, the record show uh, John was not at the meeting, so. And uh, we'll sign those in. And we have discussions with town staff. I have nothing this You're evening. You're all set? Uh, yep. Anything, John? Ditto. You're all set. Okay, board. Just wanted to say I was a few minutes late because I was stopped by the horde of turkeys that were crossing <laughs> Hillcrest. Flock. Flock. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, the whole, uh, g gaggle of geese. I, was gaggle, gaggle, of gaggle of turkeys. I don't know. I was going to say murder, but I didn't want anybody to think there really was a murder. Yeah, crows. Some some those are crows, up. right? Yeah. Get up. Murder of crows. Right. Yeah. I just want to, uh, uh, for the board, uh, is a ready, set, go. This is from Southern New Hampshire Planning Commission. This is a workshop that will discuss the new and innovative ready, set, go regional marketing and economic development tool for the Southern New Hampshire planning region, as well as recent changes to the state of New Hampshire's economic revitalization tax credit program. Uh, they welcome anyone to attend. It's free, and uh, you learn two important economic development programs that they will go cover. The Complete Ready, Set, Go program will be found at the uh, new website, www.readysetgonewhampshire, it's all one word, dot com. And this is being held Wednesday, a week from today, April 17th, uh, at the Public Service of New Hampshire uh, Building, 780 North Commercial Street. So, uh, this is up on a website, but I'll put this in the read file for anyone that is, uh, oh yeah, I'll drop that in the read file. So if anyone's interested in going and, uh, feels they want you to do something with planning uh, next Wednesday. Uh, <coughs> probably something worthwhile to take in. That is all uh, I have. So we'll proceed uh, to our continued plans. This is Pillsbury Realty, <coughs> LLC, tax map 10, lots 15, 23, 29C-2A, 29C-2B, 41, 41-1, 41-2, 42, 45, 46, 47, 48, 50, 52, 54-1, 57, 58, 59, and 62. This is an application acceptance at a public hearing for formal review of Woodmont Commons Plan Unit Development Master Plan. And this is continued from our meeting of March 27, 2013. And we'll go to the uh, applicant uh, for presentation. The floor is yours, uh, Ari. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, just for your record, I'm Ari Pollock with Gallagher, Callahan, and Gartrell. I'm legal counsel for the applicants and uh, representing the applicants tonight is Mike Kettenbach for Pillsbury Realty. Uh, also behind me is our uh, usual complement of team members. 
Uh, to my right is Jimmy D'Angelo with TEC. Uh, Jimmy is going to be providing uh, an update on some of the infrastructure discussions that have been occurring with uh, staff as well as uh, a response to the transportation update that was provided in February, uh, specifically relating to uh, the development in the, in the no build for 4A scenario. Um, <clears throat> we are currently working under the extension of the review clock that was granted at the last meeting until May 15th. Uh, and we'll, uh, that'll, uh, that <coughs> extension allowed this evening's meeting and also planning for a meeting on May 8th. Um, I, I do anticipate uh, a further extension coming at, at that time. Uh, this evening's topics, uh, as I said, relate to uh, infrastructure, uh, transportation, uh, and then running some site plan and subdivision examples through some of the emerging development standards that have been uh, the subject of some meetings between our team and uh, HSH and, of course, town staff. Um, that uh, leaves for May. Uh, the uh, much anticipated discussion on fiscal impact um, as well as a full set of the infra of the uh, development standards <coughs> excuse me and then any follow-up items that are uh, relating to infrastructure uh, and the development agreement um, all, of, all of which are underway but not prepared for presentation this evening um, <coughs> unless the board has process or scheduling questions what I'd like to do is turn it over to uh, Jimmy D'Angelo to my right, and then after him, Tom Goodwin from Shook Kelly to my left to work through uh, this evening's presentation, which tracks the briefing document that you received last week. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and what we'll do, we'll get the uh, you know the presentation first, then we'll uh, do questions. Questions will be from staff, the board, and then the uh, public, and then uh, after that, we'll have questions on questions, which we had discussed. Uh, last meeting. So. Yeah, and, and Cynthia, of course, is not able to be with us tonight. I know John is sitting in, but um, if Cynthia were here, she probably would say that the infrastructure update is nothing more than a, a quick overview of where the discussions have been headed, uh, and so I'll, I'll share that on her behalf. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, as Ari said, my name is Jim D'Angelo with TEC, and we've been working uh, to coordinate uh, the infrastructure and traffic uh, submissions um, and you have in your briefing document uh, copies of some exhibits that were part of the infrastructure memorandum that uh, were prepared and delivered to staff and first of all I want to thank staff and the peer review consultant for accommodating us uh, on Monday uh, to sit down and talk about that initial submission uh, but for tonight uh, what I would like to do is just put up those exhibits and give you a status report. Uh, the uh, items that we have submitted for infrastructure are wastewater, water supply, stormwater <coughs> management, and under the um, utilities, the private utilities, the electrical, natural gas, and communications. Uh, there are uh, a memorandum that accompany each of those. Uh, and there, as we talked about on Monday with staff, uh, there are uh, issues that uh, we need to further explore uh, in order to complete uh, that uh, submission so that we can make both the final presentation and recommendation to the board in each of those areas. And if Tom, if you give me the first uh, slide, uh, the sewer uh, collection co concept, again, our subconsultant to us, CMA, <coughs> um, worked and uh, prepared a uh, an extensive uh, technical uh, memorandum that looked at existing conditions, uh, where, where the pump stations are, where we ultimately have to go to the uh, dairy water uh, uh, sewage treatment plant. Uh, and in talking on Monday with staff, um, John particularly wanted to make sure that we got the existing condition uh, accurate. Uh, so that it was not just a question of available capacity, but also the existing conditions of the distribution to get to that capacity and the limitations of it. So uh, we went over uh, each of those elements. Uh, John had an ex uh, extensive and exhaustive uh, uh, comment page, which uh, we uh, discussed and where we should be resubmitting tomorrow 
a, an update of uh, that existing conditions analysis uh, uh, so that we be prepared next week, or excuse me, next meeting to uh, conclude the, the water and sewer uh, issues. Uh, the next slide is the uh, water uh, supply con uh, concept, and again, it shows what, where the private um, and public water supplies are. Penichuk Water would be providing water, and where th would be the locations that we would have to hit with what uh, uh, capacity that exists there and how it would be distributed. Um, and again, uh, there were some comments uh, associated with that, and we'll be updating that memo so that it would be complete and acceptable uh, both to the town and to the peer review consultant before we come back to you. Uh, and the last uh, issue is the drainage areas, and I think that um, well, this was pretty straightforward from uh, our perspective of the topography that exists on that piece of property, high spots, low spots, and uh, in the briefing document, the technical memorandum that, that uh, accompanied our submission, it talked about the intent of our design to use best practices and to use vegetated uh, <coughs> swales to bring, uh, to collect uh, the drainage and to treat it uh, in those swales, to hold it and release it. Uh, and most of that was gonna be released to our new water quality element, which was the pond. But in other areas, we use the same techniques uh, before we detain it infiltrated uh, along the way, treat it, infiltrate it, detain it, and not release it over the property line at any greater rate than what's being released now. Uh, and, and again, there's uh, some, some additional work with uh, that, but I think the biggest issue there is the issue of um, uh, having to deal with the Beaver Brook uh, salting uh, impact and Although this is a private development, a private development uh, that uh, we need to come uh, and work cooperatively with the town so that we accommodate the intent of the um, saltation uh, mitigation that has been planned both not only for 93, but also for the town roads. And we wanna make sure that we're doing it in a, in a, a complementary fashion to assist the town in bringing Beaver Brook, Brook back uh, to where it's uh, supposed to be. Uh, so those are the three components of infrastructure. Uh, and uh, again, tomorrow, tomorrow is Thursday, right, Kevin, before the close of business, so uh, that um, uh, those memorandum will be, have been updated and submitted back to the town uh, for there to be reviewed. And hopefully we'll be able, to, uh, at the next meeting, be able to resolve and finalize our, our submission package uh, in each of those areas. Um, the other element that we have on um, tap for tonight is the 4A, uh, the traffic uh, analysis, answering the question, what if there is no 4A? Uh, I mean, we did an, an exhaustive uh, traffic uh, impact study for as, we, as was required using the scenario of, of, of a full build and there were uh, questions both from the town and from the peer review consultant uh, that uh, asked for a sensitivity analysis. Uh, what if there was no 4A? And we have completed that analysis and uh, have sent it back to be uh, uh, again reviewed. And to summarize that, uh, I have Kevin Dandrade from uh, TEC who will go through that quickly to get to the final slide. Thanks. Jimmy. <coughs> Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, for the record, Kevin Dandred, uh, Principal and Senior Project Manager with TEC. Uh, and as Jimmy stated, I'll give you the synopsis of uh, the additional analysis that we did at the request of some of the board members and staff to look at uh, the development potential until or without the uh, exit 4A becoming available or being constructed. Uh, this was something that we had prepared uh, and submitted to town staff and to HSH. Uh, they reported back and they have a memorandum dated today, uh, April 10th, that affirms the process that we went through. Uh, that's the great news that uh, a lot of the back and forth that we've done with staff and HSA has been very helpful uh, in order to clarify assumptions, distribution of trips, uh, shared trips between zones, uh, and it's been a very good collaborative process to make sure that we have the answers that uh, board members and public were looking for. 
Uh, just to summarize uh, the major steps that we went through, we had selected certain key intersections that were within the master plan traffic study uh, that would be most likely affected. And we used the evening peak hour because it was the one that during the master plan traffic study jumped out as the becoming the critical peak hour over the morning period. Uh, we again test the situation without exit 4A, but still having the potential for some de development in zone uh, WC12, which is east of 93. Uh, we also looked at, as part of our um, additional analysis, how much traffic under both scenarios would head up to the northern neighborhoods through Hardy and Hovey. With each of these cases, we've assumed that the major transportation mitigation would be in place, and that's important for the board to understand, so that we're dealing with really the only variable being 4A. Uh, the intersections that were studied um, as part of this update, and you can see, and I'll try not to blind anybody, uh, the intersection of Ash and the Eastside Connector with Londonderry Road, Londonderry Road at Route 102, and Garden Lane at Route 102. Those were the key controlling intersections within the master plan traffic study that were the focus of uh, this supplemental analysis. Again, the major assumptions is that there is no foray uh, as part of the test, and it was somewhat of an iterative process for us to back into how we end up with comparable results and what level of development we might have to scale down by to keep comparable intersection operations at those three key locations without exit 4A. Uh, as part of our analysis, we assume that there is no retail, hotel, or hospital within WC12. Uh, some of that is somewhat common sensible because uh, without a major connecting arterial road from exit 4A over to Folsom and to 28, uh, that pass by traffic won't necessarily be there if there's no exit 4A. Now, there may be complementary elements of retail, but for the purposes of an, our analysis uh, and the other controlling documents that we're putting together now, we've assumed that the, the assumption is that there will be no retail, no hotel, or no hospital on that east side. With that, uh, it limits the WC12 to approximately 400,000 square feet of office space and 300 residential units. Uh, we maintain the same level of development in WC1 through WC11, uh, which is consistent with the master plan. Uh, the original traffic study. But with those characteristics of not having 4A, we had to redistribute traffic to the roadway system without having the benefit of that additional highway access. Uh, this is a summary table that shows uh, what was just described in other text to show that on the east side up above as part of the master plan, we have the controlling um, maximas there of 350 residential units. 300 hospital beds, 200 hotel rooms, 400,000 square feet of commercial office, and 350,000 of retail. As we go to the without exit 4A scenario, you can see that those have become dashes because we've re removed that from the potential trip making characteristics. This summary table of the level of service uh, on the right side is the most important part, and it documents what was originally in the traffic study from February under the full build scenario with the overall intersection operations with 4A and with the scaled down development without 4A, you can see that those results are more or less the same or in some cases slightly better. Uh, so what that hopefully does is based on the reduction of the floor area or the number of uh, hotel rooms or the hospital, uh, it puts things at the same level playing field as if uh, exit 4A existed and we had the full development. The other part of the analysis that we did was looking at the number of trips that might migrate to the north towards Route 28 or exit 5 under both scenarios. Uh, this table shows the relative volumes that are based on a very detailed breakout of the trips because when we do the analysis, we've separated out the residential from the office, uh, from the other commercial retail trips. Uh, and those are all networks and uh, traffic numbers that HSH and staff have reviewed. What we see is that on Hardy Road, uh, we could have anywhere from 38 
to roughly 70 trips per hour in that uh, AM and PM peak hour that might be introduced under either scenario. And those, again, were tried to balance so that the without exit 4A scenario was comparable. Hovey Road sees a lower traffic volume in that area. And the important thing to contemplate as we move from the stage we're in into the future and subsequent process of subdivision or site plan review, as we look towards that, that northern end of the site, um, that there are things that we can do that help guard against any potential increase in that flow for how we orient connections to Hovey Road uh, in the case when we don't have exit 4A. And those are all things where we've assumed that there are direct connections, uh, but the peace of mind for the board hopefully is that there are things that we can do as we move forward in the process that can bring the trips down to Pillsbury and then back up again so it makes that route less convenient. Uh, so as a summary of uh, uh, trips in their entirety, uh, what we did was we put together a <coughs> suggested cap on trips by major region of the PUD. And this is based on the original master plan traffic study and our supplemental analysis. Uh, and this has in particular been reviewed by HSH to look at the sensibility of those numbers so that no matter what the mix of development may be, in the various WC zones and sub-areas, we can not exceed a certain cap of trips that are generated by those regions uh, without having to seek uh, uh, approval from the board uh, because of it potentially varying from the traffic studies. So this is a way to, to guard against major variations in traffic in any particular area of the PUD, uh, but you can see that um, on this chart, the, uh, without 4A, uh, by zones, so essentially the, the major southwest, northwest, and northeast areas, uh, we put caps in both cases. Without 4A, obviously on WC12, we have a significant reduction, uh, roughly 65 to 70 percent, and that's because of the absence of that interchange. So the conclusions of this supplemental traffic analysis is that the development intensity remains the same in WC1 through 11. Uh, the potential for the major uses of retail, hotel, and hospital are limited in WC12 because of its orientation within the PUD without exit 4A. Uh, now, we would like to retain the opportunity to do elements of those uses as long as there's a comparable reduction in a trip making characteristics for the office or the residential. Uh, but that's why those trip caps are important because as long as we don't exceed that total per zone, we end up with the same anticipated traffic condition. Uh, that's really it in a nutshell as far as the update yes. on traffic. Well, yeah, I'm to, okay, because I'm going to uh, you know, questions because we've got uh, overview of the infrastructure and then we get the, uh, the traffic. So I'm going to go to staff. Yep. And also our, um, our third party <coughs> people. For any questions or comments on so far, no, just to, uh, just to update on our like Jimmy had said, uh, his his uh, summary on the, the infrastructure status was pretty well, pretty close to being. That's where we're at. I I call it just it's a work in progress right now. Um, additionally, the other thing that Jimmy had mentioned again regarding the drainage, and uh, the issue regarding the uh, chlorides and the, the TMDL that's been s set for Beaver Brook. Again, just so that everyone understands, again, the, the town of Londonderry has agreed to a assault reduction program with the state. And again, so what that in, what what that entails is again, this, the town's agreed to uh, attempt to reduce our salt usage within the Beaver Brook watershed area. This development is entirely within the Beaver Brook watershed area, and that reduction is really limited our, our agreement is to the existing roadway the existing public roadways out there so that's what we're trying to achieve so as Jimmy indicated there is a big hur uh, a big hurdle to, to jump over here and figure this out also part of this is our MS4 permit it's an EPA permit we are an MS4 uh, community we have a stormwater and again a big part of our the, our new permit that's that's in draft form right now is again, limiting our salt usage within that area. 
and again, how do we intend to to uh, address the chloride uh, contamination or again with any future development out in that area. So Jimmy's hit it right on the head. It's something that, that really needs to be worked out and thought out and how we're going to deal with it. And, and we see ourselves as coming up with a solution which is complementary to the town. You know, you've got so many miles of roadway. You've got so you have certain practices that you use now. Obviously, we're going to modify those practices. Uh, and if we can assist in modifying those practices townwide, as well as deal with our roadway system and maybe set up a model for other uh, private roadways, then uh, not only will Beaver Brook be better off, but uh, the community will be better off. And uh, if we, we absolutely, you know, we can't do this by ourselves. So that's why, even though groundwater, uh, stormwater uh, management component of this looks like it was done, save for that component. We need we need to focus on that component before and come up with an answer a solution before we come back to you. Absolutely. There are a lot of states doing a lot of work uh, with the uh, widening of I-93 as far as uh, sodium and chloride levels that are getting into the uh, uh, basically some of the uh, uh, you know like Beaver Brooks one but there's another number of brooks from Manchester south to uh, Salem that are all involved also. Correct. That's all I have for now. Okay. Uh, anything, John? I'm okay. Oh, okay. Um, Jane, uh, Ted, anything to uh, add or? You know, just to say on the traffic, uh, we work pretty closely with. Uh, could Ted. you move close to the microphone, oh, or first bring the microphone over there? Yeah. That's so people at home can uh, can hear. Okay. We work pretty closely with Tech on the 4A analysis and also on developing the trip caps. And we're satisfied that the caps that they have outlined here, they're rounded up. Of course, they're not down to the last car, but they're consistent with the materials that were provided on trip generation. And they're consistent with the traffic networks that were used in the traffic analysis, both for the with 4A and without 4A scenarios. I think the methodology has been sound. Um, I think the one point that Kevin raised that's important is that either with or without 4A, the levels of service that they talk about are dependent on implementation of that whole off-site mitigation program uh, west of the highway and then along 102 uh, going to 93 northbound so it's important to keep that in mind in terms of looking at those trip caps you're not going to achieve those levels of service unless that mitigation is uh, carried out um, the only other point about the 4a um, uh, analysis is that um, a good number of the trips were rerouted to the east either down <coughs> Pillsbury to Londonderry Road or out um, Folsom Road to Route, one, Route 28 going up to Exit 5. So that kind of gets uh, some of those trips, particularly the Folsom Road ones out of Londonderry's hair, but the folks in Derry might have some comments about um, that <laughs> particular aspect of the, of the uh, analysis so yeah and and again this was sensitivity analysis full build from a planning perspective for the zone change you know we fully realize that when we come back we come back in reality for a specific use uh, it'll be a component of it but this is the backdrop that we weigh it against so uh, the pieces of that mitigation that necessarily have to be in place will be weighed against what pieces of the full bill development that we'll be uh, putting forward. Right, but this sets forth the big picture, the long-term maximum build-out, uh, what would be necessary to accommodate what the board is being asked to approve. So yeah. um, uh, the other kind of fine point that, that we discussed in terms of the maximum trip 
caps was that um, the distribution of entering trips and exiting trips in the peak hours is dependent on the mix of land uses. And it's hard to specify, you know, we talked about whether we should break down so many trips in and so many trips out of each of the zones as a maximum cap, but it's, it's hard really to do that. I think the totals are appropriate because um, depending on how the land uses pan out, uh, the fact that there are fewer trips in one direction might make it easier for more trips in the other direction to be accommodated. So, um, I'm really going to have a, um, a balance there. And I think probably right. if, if this does come to fruition, let's say, it has to be carefully monitored on what can uh, expand That's right. what can expand. And it's the beauty of mixed use, really, is that you get that balance between the inbound and the outbound, that it's not all office development where everybody comes in in the morning and leaves at night, or not all residential where everybody leaves in the morning and comes back at night, but you get some balance that helps, you know, better use the roadway capacity and the signal capacity. And as we, as we go forward in the process, there will be other traffic studies that will look at, you know, the subdivision level, the site plan level for major chunks of the project that will be able to go back and test against all the documentation that's been done to date. Mm -hmm. I'll do the, uh, the board. Uh, we'll just go through it. Uh, I'm glad you asked. If you could come back to me. Okay, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, <coughs> a couple of questions. I want to go back to the, the sewer and the water for a moment. Um, from a capacity standpoint, have we looked at what that's going to do to the current infrastructure as far as capacities? What is what is current capacity today and what is capacity at full build out? I, I think at this time, John, again, we've had some initial discussions. You know, they, they did pr prepare a technical memorandum. We've give, given them some comment and I don't, I think it's unfair for us, for them to, to quite, it, it's premature to respond to that right yet just so that we can have all the, the correct numbers. It's just some inconsistencies in the numbers. We do have some concern about capacities and whatnot. Um, so they're still working on that, John. When do but, we expect to have But that, that was the purpose of the exercise. You yeah. know, that's what, our, that's what our obligation is. Correct. To, is this is what, uh, at full build, with this mixed uses, this is what kind of, for instance, sewer, this is what kind of sewer that we'll be generating. And these are the points that we're looking to, that we have to hit, and these are with the capacity here at uh, at the plant, and how does it get there, and where's the cap now with the intermunicipal agreement, and uh, what kinds of things that are going to be necessary in okay. order to deliver? Maybe I'm not, I'm, 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 you know, maybe I'm not getting it across. You build something out, you're talking about what the current capacity is. What is the current capacity today, say, in the sewer system, that we're going to be connecting this to? But the that's what we're, that's what they're. We don't know that number right at. now. Is what oh, you're telling me. No, no. The current, the current, the current. The current, the current the current yeah, we we know we know, we know that number. What are, what is that number today? Well, I don't have the memo in front of me, but I'm thinking it's like 300. I think it's yeah, 230 GP. Uh, yeah, 200, 230 is 230. one number. Then there's the top number. Uh, no, that is 230. What again? 230,000 gallons per day. Per day, and what is it? That's what they're doing today, or is that no, a full capacity? No, that's that's what that's what we bought into the system. That's what. London Dairy is permitted to, to discharge the dairy. So we as a town have bought that? Um, correct. Okay. So a couple of things. We as a town have bought that, and how much of that have we consumed? Uh, I think we're only at 90,000 gallons a day. 90,000. And the facility itself, what is it rated for from a capacity standpoint? Um, again, that's, that's, those were some clarifications that, they, that we need to, to get clarified. Okay. So, and so you're right, John. There, there is a point where we have to buy additional capacity. There's, there's a point where dairy will have to improve the, the wastewater treatment plant, do some upgrades. So those are all things that, that's... Well, I'm trying to understand that point, right? Because if, if we take maximum numbers for everything that we've been talking about as far as maximum build-out, maximum roadways, maximum traffic, and all the maximums, obviously we need to look at maximum, uh, you know, waste, water, facilities consumption, right, and what, what that's going to do as a burden for us as far as that's concerned, uh, as well as what the 
uh, uh, the facility is going to have for a burden at full capacity. So I would expect we would see these numbers. Yeah, oh, and you will see the numbers, okay. and, and that's what um, yeah. we have done in initial assessment, and we're refining that assessment now. But we do have a myriad of numbers that will be presented to you in May that will document all of those capacity questions, but also the uh, critical things that we need to do to upgrade the system to have that full build. Yes, there's some reserve capacity today, but what we're outlining currently in the in the um, revised memo is the other major actions that are going to be necessary to, uh, with some thresholds essentially, that say at this point this would need to be upgraded at this next point. This would be uh, necessary for upgrades, but ultimately there is capacity in the dairy wastewater treatment plant. Uh, but we'll also be talking about the process for when those caps are for revising the IMA, the Inter Municipal Agreement, uh, and what is being used currently. So all that, all those facts will be presented to you in May. Yeah, and that's what, what that's why I just wanted to bring up the the exhibits just to show you where we are as a starting point and understanding what we have to hit. Uh, but I think that uh, on Monday, uh, John added another dimension to it, which was it's not just. I'm going to ask a, another question. I don't even know what you're trying to hit at this point. You got some drawings on the, the map that show me what you're going to run for a sewer based on roads that we haven't seen yet, on capacities that we know are maximums. I'm not even sure what you're trying to hit at this particular point. So I'm confused. I'm not a very smart guy, but I'm a little bit confused at what what we're you, you, what what you're talking about trying to hit from thresholds, and we're going to get a myriad of numbers. I'm just trying to figure out capacities at this particular point for the project, and we don't even have those things. Well, the thing, when I say what we have to hit, it's the, just like the water. There's a point where water is delivered now. So we have to extend that water down to us. Do we have uh, capacity? Well, that's my next question. Do we have capacity for water as well? There, because there, and, and we don't know. And yet, well, no, we do know. We do know. Well, then what is it? It, it? There is more than sufficient capacity for water to serve this development. It's how, we, how it gets there. There is okay. capacity available to serve this development. So, so from the, the, how much capacity? All right. So, so it's it's here to serve this again. I'm going to ask the same question: from the ability to supply water as well as sewer into this facility, right? What is the current capacity? What is the the maximum capacity into the town at this particular rate at the, at the current services that we have? That's the first thing I'd like to know. The second is I'd like to know what the burden is of those services. And how much remain, how much overhead or, or headroom we're going to have once this is built out at full capacity. So if that could, we can understand how that's going to impact the rest of the town that may be building around it so we can have some idea of what it's going to cost us for growth. Right. And, and if, I could if, I, if I could just ask you just to wait till we finish so that we have a complete existing conditions so that we can lay that on top. And that's fine. I'm asking for these things because yeah, I don't see it I, here I, and, understood and understand it. this and, is what uh, I'm after. Uh, if I could just make you feel comfortable, that's the purpose of the exercise, and those answers will be in the technical memorandum. Okay. Um, next question that I have, if you, if you could go back to the numbers that were on the board, go back a couple of slides, please. Um, uh, forward again, I'm sorry. Did I forward. Back. Where did I go? Uh, <laughs> no, I'll be in Hardy Trips. Uh, yeah, stop here. Let's start with this one for a second. The question that I have. so. Uh, you, you have, w firstly, why did, why did you not take into consideration Gilcrest in this? Uh, Gilcrest feeds into Hardy, obviously. Um, but uh, what I understood the concern was previously was the number of trips that feeds to the north along Hardy and Hovey. So, so people cutting through those two roads. But <coughs> Gil Gil Gilcrest will still be part of that. Would you, do you oh, disagree? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and Gilcrest will see significantly more traffic than those. Right. So I, I, would love I, to, I would love to see the Gilcrest numbers as well for, for no 4A as they, well as 4A. They do have that. They have complete networks for all of the okay. study area intersections with and without 4A. But this table was put together at our request because it had come up at the planning board and a neighbor had raised the concern about sure. Hubby Road and Hardy Road. So I asked them to pull that out specifically to respond to the request. Right, and I, and I appreciate that. I, I know that's the case, but I think Gilcrest is also a major component yeah, of, of this study. Yeah, and it is in the, uh, it is and documented. And it'd be good to see the comparison there. The, the, the next question that I have about, about these numbers, so uh, let's see, uh, through tip, uh, through trip, right, 38 to th uh, 69 per hour? Correct. And what, what is the, um, 
What is the, 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 the period for hours? So is it over a 24 hour basis or is it over peak time basis, six hour, two hour? This, this is hour? a peak assessment. So this is, um, uh, to put it in perspective, uh, Hardy Road has roughly or uh, just over 300 vehicles per hour. Um, and the, the AM and PM peak are, are fairly equal as you go north of the project site. Um, so the 69 trips, say, in the evening peak hour would be on top of that 300 per hour that already exists today. So this uh, is on top of 300? Correct. So these are not total numbers? No, no, this is, the, this is just the new PUD generated trips. So this is additional? Correct. Saying, okay. Okay. Um, it, it'd probably be best to see that as, as total trips as well. As, as, well, as I think if you're going to do that, though, you sh it should be um, current and then additional so that we have absolutely. the understanding yeah, absolutely. that yeah. you're not adding 365. I don't want anybody to have that impression. Correct. Yeah, and, and really it's, um, uh, it's a, a twofold answer that we need to give. One is a percent increase, but that's not necessarily a reflection of capacity because uh, some of those roads have capacity for more traffic it's really the, the qualitative aspect of traffic that we're talking about, the, well, the have, number have, of new trips that passes by anybody. The qualitative and the quantitative, but you also then have the reality of what traffic does on these roads, regardless of, of what, in, in a statistical model, how the road is going to work, right? Would Correct. Agree? So yeah, today, oh yeah. I think looking at, at what, the, what the, um, the, the totals are, right, and then you can show us what we think the capacity is, because we've asked about capacity in the past. As, as, a, as a percentage of what you think it is. And then the increased trips, which I think Mary's right, we should show those, but also as a percentage of the increase of those trips and of the total capacity. That's very easy for us to put together, okay. um, just as a sum of what it would exist in the future without the project, what the project adds, and the total. Yeah, because I, I, I did. I struggled with this chart with, with what, what am I trying to get out of this and, and, and what does it mean to me? We need to relate it with other, other numbers right. also. So can you roll to the next? Um, yes, this one. So explain this one to me. So uh, through the area you have without uh, 4A is uh, 3,450, and then with exit 4A you have 5,150, which is an interesting number. Um, if, uh, if I take that, how do, I, how do I equate that? Is that per hour? Uh, this is or per day, right? No, Increase? this is peak hour. The, the, the top peak described peak hour. peak hour over the weekday. Yeah, no, this is. The peak hour of the weekday evening, so say uh, 5 to 6 p.m. So 5,000 5, 5, trips in peak hour? That's correct. And Over all the different roads. For everywhere. And, yeah, all the different driveways um, that leave any particular sub-area of the site, the PUD. Okay, so in, in, in again, what is peak hour? What, between what hours? The weekday evening peak hour could be 4.30 to 5.30, 5 to 6. You know, the, the roads in this area during the typical commuter hour. Which is? Is right in that area. Okay. It's, it's for a one hour period as a snapshot of what the PUD would generate. Okay, so during peak hour, 5,000 more trips would be generated with, with exit 4A. And without 4A, it would be 3,400. Correct. That, with that's the cap that, we, that we're suggesting that we pick. It can't be any more than that without 4A. Okay. Um, okay, so okay, that, that that's helpful with with, with what, what that really means. Um, one other question that I, I, I have uh, that I caught on to you had made a, a, a statement about um, industrial versus non-industrial, and I just found your comment interesting, and you don't have to comment on it, but you said you know with, with industry people come in to go to work and then they leave to to get out of work. And I think that the premise of how this thing is being sold to us at this particular point is that those people would be working and living in this community. And it sounded to me like that's not what you said. Because that would, no, well, I, that I would only generate trips. In, in, that would only generate trips within the community of, of, of the of, of Woodmont Orchards. It sounds to me that that's, that's something different than what you said. Well, what I, I was talking in general about a commercial land use like office versus residential. In this, for this development, they did assume 
a certain number of the trips, a small percentage of the trips, I think it was 12% is what we ended up agreeing on, would be internal to the PUD zones, to those 600 acres. But they did uh, route, and this gets very specific, but they did route trips that would be going, say, from the west to the east across Pillsbury Road, for example, or across 102, so they do show up on the, on the public roads. But they did not assume that everybody who lives in the development would work in the same place or that everybody who worked there would live there. And that um, also takes into consideration hospital and hotel trips with 4A and without 4A? Yes, although there's no hospital with, uh, no hospital or hotel, no hospital at all and no hotel on the east side without 4A. No questions. Thank you. Uh, Mary. I was just um, disappointed that this slide wasn't in our update. Maybe you just got this or you just generated this. It wasn't in your package? It, it, was, really, in our package. it was really a summary for the summary, purposes yeah. of, of the presentation tonight. Um, <coughs> it, it's certainly available. I mean, it's, it was just really a, a, a very generalized breakout of all these trips. But um, we do have a summary um, of those trip caps. Uh, within within the briefing documents, just not exactly in that table form. So it's we're happy Those to numbers it. aren't there, though. I don't see, I didn't read those numbers anywhere in the briefing document. Did I miss them? The numbers are in table two in the document that they put out March 27th, and then they revised it today. Uh, yeah, and it's in and table two. We're, we're happy to provide that so that the board has, yeah. uh, everybody has a copy of Yeah, the, you, the you have a table report. two and you have a table one, but I don't think those numbers are here. Yeah, because table Those table aren't one. the total. I was just it's not in the this, total. Not in this general right. briefing document, no. but in the tech memo that they prepared. Oh, probably, uh, yeah, yeah, probably they had the detailed. detailed spreadsheets that provide the basis for those caps, and I did go over that really carefully to be sure that we could trace those numbers back to the trip generation and then to the traffic numbers. Within we, the, yeah, within the final version, that can be implemented as well. Th this as will a, be in the final version. Yes, anyway. so that, it, that is a very clear and concise summary of those caps, and that's um, Thank you. can easily be provided. Thank you. There is one point about the caps that is of note for the planning board that, that you need to look at carefully is that they did suggest a 15% variance from the caps. And I think where the traffic numbers have been based, either with or without 4A, on a certain development program and a certain mitigation package, if you think about increasing the overall numbers by 15%, that would require Reduction. more mitigation. So I think it's, you know, you definitely have to consider the request to have a variance in these numbers, but it's important to know that if you do allow them to be raised, that more mitigation would be required. Okay, so we're going to really look at it like <coughs> plus 15% and minus 15% and the effects there and then the effects on it from the average. It's really between zones, just to clarify for the board that right, there was that's a 15% 15 variance in the, the three major areas of the PUD um, without a 15% variance overall. So it, it allows for some flexibility within the zones while not creating a, a starkly different okay. traffic situation overall. And that may still require some medication because of the type of development that you're doing in those particular right. areas. Absolutely. But as far as the total is concerned, the cap is the cap. Correct. It's the 15 percent variance would be within that cap. Exactly. With that said, though, the difference between the east and the west, the cap of trips in zones 1 through 11 is pretty much the cap that needs to be respected so that while there might be some flexibility like they mentioned the northwest zone has some extra capacity so you might put a few more trips up there but that garden lane intersection is is kind of a uh, 
choke point. So, you know, the flexibility even within the zones, I think, is constrained by the some of those key capacity choke points. Yeah, no, so I think no, there's these no guys debate on that understand. from us. It's really we agree. <laughs> I just I wouldn't imagine that you would want to develop <coughs> something that's going to be difficult for people to get in and out of. Correct. So I'm not concerned. Thank you. Okay, Lynn. So uh, <clears throat> question on stormwater discharge again. Uh, so how does how do uh, you know salt discharge and overall just stormwater discharge into Beaver Brook get measured? Quanti you know quantitatively measured today. Um, again, what <coughs> DOT had actually through. Uh, the Department of Environmental Services, Linda had done a, a, a study of Beaverbrook and they had looked at chlorides and that's, that's how they came up with a, a, a TMDL, a total maximum daily loading mm -hmm. on Beaverbrook. <coughs> so again, I'm not, I'm not a uh, environmental scientist, so as far as, you know, they take the sample and they determine what it, the impact it is to the aquatic life and they they look at that. That's that's <coughs> how they, they determine these TMDLs. So that's that's kind of the the engineer in me telling you how they did that stuff. So the impact of the project is you know, is measured by the amount of roads or square feet of road surface times well, the, the again, amount of salt that we typically put down. You on got square it foot of road. right now. That that is, that is the you know calcium calcium chloride is the the means of or chloride is is the means of winter maintenance. Mm -hmm. That's that's how we all do it. But that's how the rates typically measured, though, is just something like that, just uh, based on the the, uh, yeah. the miles of road being Correct. added. Correct. Yeah. <coughs> times yeah. the Three hundred pounds a mile. Add. Yeah. Lane mile. Yeah. So when we went through our calculation for the existing roadways, we know what our, the rate of salt that our trucks discharge, and so that's how we were able to, to come up with our, what what number we do we we presently use within the watershed mm -hmm. and then again in order for town of londonderry we have a portion of the the drainage area for beaver brook so we extrapolated it back saying okay well we need to reduce it by x amount okay so again right now though that number is only based on <coughs> the miles of existing public road within that watershed is there a way that uh, the actual amount of storm water discharged into the brook gets measured as well you know, before um, and after? We don't do that. Again, the, the, the requirement typically is, again, just no, no increase in the rate of runoff. But <coughs> if we don't know really the starting point, you know, it's kind of hard to measure the ending point as well. So I was just kind of curious because, yeah. you know, Beaverbrook has uh, flooding problems downstream from this. Well, again, but they do have a, uh, I, they do have a, USGS had a gauging station down at uh, Kendall Pond Dam that they had installed and had done some some uh, recording of what the flow in the in the brook was. I don't know what those numbers are though, off the top of my head. Okay, would that be kind of measuring it after the fact though? After yeah, right. but again though, that's <coughs> just the rate. That's not the you know again that the the, uh, the study for the TMDL. I don't. Uh, I think there was five sampling locations within the the stretch of Beaver Brook that they had done that sampling. And, and I don't think there's any intention that the project would be held to a lower standard than what the town does elsewhere. As, as John described, you know, there's a requirement to not increase the peak flows off right. the perimeter of the property. Just like any other project that the board would see, um, it's really about how we do that. A combination of biofiltration areas or uh, infiltration, detention areas that will be identified not now but at the site plan stage. Uh, and really the purpose of uh, this process here would be to set the guiding principles that would be consistent <coughs> and also complement what the town needs to do as the requirement and uh, what can be uh, the principles and, and guidelines for the PUD for how the users within the PUD will go about controlling salt usage in a cooperative effort to reduce that towards Beaverbrook. Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, the, it's a two-pronged effort though, salt and just the, the total volume of storm water as well. And then the other question I had, goes back to the dairy, I'll use the dairy wastewater treatment plan as the example. If there are improvements needed to that, is it typically the users of that system that pay for the improvements or is it the, is it spread over the towns, all the town's taxpayers? Um, again, that, that's up for discussion. That's a, yet up for discussion, Lynn. We need to determine what those impacts will be and uh, and again, it, we'll have to, to work with, with the intermunicipal agreement and. 
because today I thought there was like the sewer, you know, we have the municipal sewer agreement. I thought all the, uh, the users of it paid for the total cost of maintenance and operation for the sewer system. Um, the, the, your user, yeah, your, your user fees. Right. Yeah. Right. So your, I, your access fees actually pay for capital improvements and for pass buying into the system. That's how I always explain it to people. You're buying into a system that the town's already paid for. Right, right. But I would expect if there's any improvements needed, you know, to, let's say, to the treatment plan again, if there's any improvements needed because of the added capacity that uh, is being placed on it, the needs for capacity, that uh, the users would once again be for the people paying for it and not, you know, through user fees. Right. But as again, opposed to the town, you know, the, the rest of the, all of us on septic systems, we wouldn't be putting the bill for it. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, then just another general question. We had section four in the book, and uh, we haven't had any discussion on that. Are we going to have a discussion on that tonight as well? What's the uh, section four, Lynn? That's the subject of coming next. Oh, that's, that, that's, that's coming. Next. I think you, we're just dealing okay. right now that's fine. with uh, the uh, you know, infrastructure and the roads. That's fine. I don't want to cover too that. wide an area because I don't want to keep us focused somewhat. So. I missed that. So I'm, I'm all set. Thank okay. you. Okay, Laura? No questions right now. Okay, Lisa. Mm -hmm. Um, my only comment was um, when you first um, started talking about um, the salt on the roads, we talked about working out a, a process where together the town and the developer would have to work out a process on the, the salt numbers. And I don't know, that kind of red, raises red flags in my head. Should I be worried that, that you know, <laughs> that... Uh, the salt number can only be X, and if it can't go above X, then it has to be smoothed out in other places, and therefore less salt is used in other places. Is Again, that a fair right, assumption? right now it's in the Beaverbrook watershed, so that's our main concentration. And how and much larger is the Beaverbrook watershed around this development? I'm sorry? How much larger, like, where does it encompass? Who else does it encompass beyond this development? Um, town of Derry. Derry has some. Again, getting back to your question, though, again, like I said, we have a salt <coughs> reduction plan to address our existing roadways, our existing public roadways. So that's what we're trying to achieve. So to say, what are they going to do? That's the burden is on them in my mind. Because mm -hmm. we're trying to achieve, we're trying to ex achieve, I'm just going to use some numbers. We're at 250, we're trying to achieve 200. So obviously if they're gonna add additional roads, mm -hmm. how we're gonna get there, but is, it's... Would that, something, would that be something that would be discussed in this forum at any given point, or would that be something that would be discussed in another forum? I think it should be discussed in this forum because it's, it's an projects, environmental issue. When projects come up individually and the the yeah. effective rate. I, I think, think it should how, also be how we deal with addressed it. at this stage of the game, too. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I just want to understand how that process works because yeah. I, I start to get nervous about you, that. You know, my, my only comment on that would, would be, and I've been leaving the technical discussion to the technicians, but th this is a problem that any developer or applicant in town faces. And, you know, the, 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 the goal for us is to reach some sort of a mm -hmm a negotiated conceptual approach so that when we get into the site plan and subdivision phases we have some backdrop of concept to rely on so that we don't just hit a rock wall then for being able to predict it now the idea is to have some alternatives in mind uh, some ways that maybe the town can work with us to better budget for salt use so that there is a capacity available not just for this project but for other projects uh, so that the alternatives are studied and explored and, and known so that when an applicant comes in, makes an application, whether it's within the PUD or elsewhere, they're not just turned away because they don't have uh, capacity for, for maintaining roadways with, with chloride products. And, and there are alternatives out there, and I'm no expert on them, but I know they exist. Yeah. yeah. No, and, and yeah. alternatively, we want to understand those things as, as we head into this as well. So mm -hmm. as long as I can understand that that will be addressed, well, we technical people are dying to <laughs> provide alternatives that would assist in reducing this uh, this issue, right? And I mean, traditionally, not to digress, but traditionally, what happens is that when you salt the road, 
Well, you get the okay. back of the truck and you bam. Don't, could you pull the microphone a little closer oh, to you, please? Me. So when you, you know, traditionally you, you sand and salt the road mm -hmm. between certain temperatures, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, below it, it's no good, and above it, it's uh, it's no, it's not needed. Um, and the traditional way of doing it, you just load up your spreader and off you go, and it, and it, sometimes they're not calibrated to the speed of the truck, and so you're dumping more than you need in certain areas. So that's the first thing is make sure that it's calibrated. Secondly, a lot of that stuff hits the road and bounces, mm -hmm. right, and ends up on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. And here we're trying to treat this road. So there's ways of treating this road without doing it in the traditional fashion. So what, when I say we have to work together, we have to understand it's not just about, oh, we used to throw 300 pounds down per lane. Now we're only going to throw 250. Hmm, but maybe we can throw 200 and use 200 in a better way. Maybe we can help you figure out a way to do that. And maybe that may take a different kind of truck or a different kind of calibration. Uh, and if equipment. we participate in that, then we, we would <coughs> like to get at least two attaboys on the back of the <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, and so that's the kind of You guys gonna buy the trucks? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. That's, the, that's why this is not resolved yet. <laughs> so, yeah, and th that's the kind of discussion that we're taking place. We'd like to come to you, oh, we've worked this out, we've got an idea, we've got a solution that seems like it makes sense, but we are not there yet. Yeah, because even, yeah. even the state is doing a lot of experimenting with uh, I-93 because mm -hmm. they have to mitigate both the sodium and the, and the uh, chloride levels, which come from other salts also. And as a result, they have a mitigation program that allows them to pave a total of six lanes and widening, not the eight lanes, because they don't have a program there yet. So there's not going to be the full width of I-93 because of the, uh, the mitigation that is going on. So, I mean, the state's got a problem, we've got a problem, and then you get people complaining about slippery roads in the wintertime. So yeah, I just want to be reassured that when the power goes out, I can get to the local coffee shop. <laughs> you, know, you can always get to the, the local road. coffee shop. Are you kidding? That's one of the mitigation generators for everyone. <laughs> well, you know what, Letha, we, we, I attend a, a salt reduction meeting monthly or quarterly with DOT and you know DES and all the communities around and and that's the biggest thing that you know we've talked about all these methods and but the biggest thing is is people Coffee. need to learn how to drive need to relearn how to drive either you know <laughs> pick up your cup of coffee and your bread on your way home because you know tomorrow is going to this that's is what beyond planning that's what a big yeah. 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 I'll stop now I'll get off my horse I'll get off my horse <laughs> hey, if they're open I'm going yeah. hey, we're in Londonderry there is a dunks on every that's corner exactly. you don't have to worry about it yeah. you can get there I can't brew I'm going okay anything else uh, okay Maria yeah uh, no I really don't have anything but it just it sounds like there's a the whole state it sounds like there's like new state rules and laws about this whole salting that's what yeah, you were EPA. saying before Yep. So you're dealing with state rules and regulations as well as just this development that we're talking about? Correct. Okay. No, I'm good otherwise. Okay. Yeah. yeah, just one question. Uh, I notice in your biofiltration you use plants and microbes. Is that similar to wetlands replication? Do you use wetlands plants? Yes. And yeah, do you well, introduce microbes or are they naturally occurring? I, you know, I wish Jeff Wilson was here uh, because he's got he, – He's got a write-up that, that talks about he's picking the kinds of plants that he wants on the on the swale. Uh, so he's down to the size and kind of plants and talking about where we're going to go get those plants uh, to make sure that they're mature enough to be planted in the swale when we're, when we're uh, building the swales. Okay, I was kind of curious about that. All set? Okay, uh, Tom. Oh, thanks. Um, if, if you could go back to the last shot you had up there. And what, yeah, that's it. Yeah. So you saying the base right now, for example, at Hardy Road is is approximately 300. Correct. Yeah, so uh, where Hardy meets Hovey, okay. the, the through traffic on Hardy Road is approximately 300 or just over 300 per hour. And the 38 to 69, again, reflects morning and night or? Uh, Exactly, yeah. Up above it says without four, exit 4A and in parentheses AM and PM. So the numbers below, the first one's AM, the second one's PM. Okay, so you're suggesting that 69 trips without additional trips without exit 4A, um, that 
the current roadway has a capacity to uh, sustain a, a f approximately a 33 percent increase in traffic? It has capacity to handle significantly more than that. Uh, what really the purpose of this was to uh, give some input and some information to the board and to the public about the new trips that could be anticipated from the PUD that would go up through those neighborhoods. So uh, it would be unrealistic to assume that somebody wouldn't want to go to uh, Giovanni's to get a pizza or to go to a business up on 28th or to access exit 5 simply because they want to take the local road system rather than an interstate highway. So that factors in for some of that distribution that is naturally going to occur from any development uh, in this area that would migrate to the north. So again, when you see the numbers are, are very consistent between the, the left and the right side columns, it's because we've pared down the development um, until such time as exit 4A is implemented. You've, you know where that exit is? You've ever been there at 5 o'clock at night, that intersection? Oh, uh, yeah, I've been through all these intersections at... Uh, no, at 5 o'clock, you know, yes. 6 o'clock? Okay. Yes. And do you think a one-third increase in traffic is just a, what? a minor event? At Hardy and Hubby? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there is capacity to do it, and we've already tested the capacity analysis within the original study from February mm -hmm. to show that there's still good levels of service um, overall. Um, obviously, this, there's no difference in traffic <coughs> control. You'd still have a stop sign on the side street, and although delays would increase over what they are today, uh, they're not at a point that um, suggests any other change in traffic control to try to mitigate those impacts. Okay, but you, you agree that there'll be an increase in, del in delay, right? Correct. I, I can't sit here and say there will not be, um, but <coughs> what is anticipated for the extra volume to go up in that direction? Uh, and keep in mind, too, that as we add traffic, say on Hovey Road, as it would go north towards party and comes to the stop sign um, there is a balancing point too where uh, with the other capacity improvements that we'll be making in and around the PUD whether it's on 102 or Londonderry Road that it becomes that much more attractive if you're trying to go to the north to go across the Ash Street Bridge take a right onto Londonderry Road at the southerly end we're planning on a new signal down there with additional lane capacity taking a right and then slip right onto the northbound on-ramp so there are these other mitigation improvements that we've conceptualized to date, uh, that's why we've said that they are important under both the with and without exit for a assessment because we still want to make it as efficient as possible to get to exit 4 and exit 4A once it's implemented. But is it, isn't there an effect by increasing the delay by a third or traffic by a third, isn't there a, an effect on, on not only the people involved in the traffic, but the abutters who have to now put up with this for an extra one third of the amount of time? Well, the, the um, and that's why I say it's not necessarily about traffic capacity, it's about the perception of additional vehicles going by. That, that impact that we can't quantify, but says any traffic, no matter where development occurs in London area, um, there will be traffic volumes that distribute to other roadways that don't warrant mitigation or there's no uh, necessary change in traffic control. Um, <coughs> as you, you said, excuse me, you said it doesn't warrant mitigation, is that the phrase? You that's used? correct. At that intersection at Hardy and Hovey, in our professional opinion, and this has been reviewed by staff and by your peer review consultant, the level of increase would not warrant any change in traffic control at that intersection. And, and what's the criteria for that that you believe or staff believes that it doesn't warrant uh, a mitigation? It, it's one car a minute. It's one additional car a minute on a two-lane roadway that has, you know, you say it's a su significant capacity. It has sufficient capacity to handle it. And yeah, there are delays at stop conditions. Um, but again, when uh, this is this is again from the planning perspective at the beginning, when we come in uh, for a specific development, and that's why Kevin, the last part of his slide was that now if th this uh, Hardy and Hovey uh, are of 
significant concern to the abutters, then there are things that we can do as we lay, as we put our development in on that north side so that it, you know, implement traffic calming measures, make it circuitous so it's not an easy way. So, but we had to present a worst case scenario because if we try to present something that was rosier than that, our peer consultants would say, excuse me, <laughs> you're presenting too rosy a condition here. Just like the, you know, the comment about... Uh, uh, if you could give me an example of something that would mitigate that, some sort of traffic patent altering. I <coughs> don't make a direct connection to it because we're coming from our development. So we, d we lay out the street system. And so if you have to, you know, instead of going straight up, we, we make you go left. <laughs> You can go right, well, left, and back yeah, up again. You have to make a hook. Well, it, ma it makes it more attractive to let go me, some let other me, place. Let me give but, you but my perception. Well, just, just hold on a second. Let me, let me give you my perception. Right now, people have to um, abide by or tolerate what's there now. You're putting in a development. My view is that as a taxpayer and owner of the land, Nothing should change for them. So you can have your development there, but don't impose any burden, and I mean any burden, on anybody else, either money, taxes, or not one or more car. Yeah, how, how frankly, is it possible? Yeah. How you is it find, possible you know, to you're develop anything? You're the one that's. Wait, excuse me. You're the one that's putting in the development. Okay, uh, and this isn't you know twenty houses. This is sixteen hundred potential problems. Yeah. So again. My question is this, is there something you can do to make it so it's like it is now? The delay is there We now. don't make a connection. What? Then we don't make a connection, but I, then... I, I don't understand what that means. We, we don't hit, we, we don't make a through road coming through our, from our property to, to Hubby Road. Okay. Right. So, and if so we do that, it's feasible, then, and we it's still feasible to do something. You, you guys have determined that you know it doesn't warrant it, but it is feasible to do it. Uh, what I can tell you is, it is not feasible to assume that there will not be one increase in trips. Traffic has connectivity to Hardy Road to Hovey Road in the future, no matter how they get there from any particular project. It's really about the reasonableness of what we consider level service that may get to a tripping point someday, whether well, it's... Well, reasonable, this actually depends on where you're looking from. Absolutely. Okay, no, and it, no it might be unreasonable for me if I'm on the corner over there to, to put up with additional cars that could be mitigated by you doing something with the traffic pattern. Would you agree with that? Okay, so we cut that off. If we're still going to develop something, those trips are going to come down to the, to the front door instead of the back door. So we're going by somebody else's. Uh, front door. So if, if you're applying that criteria, everybody has to be, be treated exactly the same. Our trips just have to stay within, uh, which is what we're trying to do with this mixed-use development. And again, right. you know, we used a, 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 a... Well, as you said, you're the technical guy. See, I'm not the technical yeah. guy. <laughs> I, I'm just telling you what my okay, philosophy I, is. I, that I, it hear you, I hear you clearly. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right. Um, if we can go to the, uh, actually, John, maybe you have the answer. So you, you indicated on the water the town purchases 200, I think you said 8,000 we purchased from dairy? No, no, yeah, the, uh, the wastewater. Yes. What we have for discharges, yeah, was it, don't quote me on those numbers. Or, it's but again, anyways, yeah, we, we have a, a municipal, intermunicipal agreement with dairy that we can discharge X amount of flow whatever that number and is. And you said we currently discharge about 90,000? That, that was yeah, my recollection. Okay. Now, does it, is it a uniform cost? I mean, if I discharge 180,000, it's radically the same? Or does it increase <coughs> as we get closer to the capacity level? Um, right now, again, it, it, it's a... Uh, it's a flat rate? It's a flat rate, yeah. Okay. And the only thing that prevents that flat rate from being a flat rate is our intermunicipal agreement? Pretty much, yeah. Which I presume dairy could change? Yeah. Um, although it is, it is good for X amount of years, and I don't quite know what that time frame is, Tom. Because they can't do it just willy-nilly. Okay. And do we have any idea what the 
Woodmont development will push towards yep. the in, maximum? In their technical in their technical memorandum, they, they have run those numbers, but again, there were some concerns with the, the, the numbers that they did run, so they need to go back to the, that's why it's a work in progress. Okay. Um, um, if I can go back to the uh, analysis assumptions you used in the uh, trips, it, it, let me start with, It, so we're, we're at there. Trip, it's, tri, it says in, in um, your briefing, uh, it says trip distributions. 50% of trips, this is on WC-12, to and from I-93 North are, anticipate, are anticipated to access the PUD area <coughs> via exit 4. Okay. Then if we uh, go down to WC-7 through 11, uh, oh. They indicate it's going to be 75 percent. And if we look at uh, WC1 through WC6, it's 90 percent heading to exit 4. So what, uh, what page are you looking at? Uh, looking at page 14, 14, 14, 14, 14, 13 and 14, yeah. Yes, okay. I'm okay. with you now. So I guess my question is, what kind of additional um, volume are we placing on exit four? And, and do you, have you quantified any kind of delay that that's going to cause? Uh, we have, and that was uh, quantified within the original study mm -hmm. from February 6th uh, that documents in, in great detail um, the levels of service at each of those intersections, including two off ramps from exit four. Uh, with the work that NHDOT is going to be implementing soon for those interchange improvements. Uh, we still have acceptable levels of service based on the state's criteria within the roadway there for what that would be in our uh, 2032 horizon year. And that's that's both with and without exit 4A. Okay. Now, when you say it's, it's in an acceptable level here, what does that mean for the person, the commuter who goes on to exit four now, how much of an additional burden is he going to have to bear? Well, uh, what you're going to see very soon is that um, once DOT widens the bridge structure over 93 at exit four, uh, the biggest, most obvious change is going to be that going eastbound on Route 102, there will soon be a double left turn lane that would go on to the northbound on ramp uh, instead of the singular lane that soaks up a lot of time and a lot of capacity and backs up for a great distance uh, because it's in that singular lane. Uh, the through capacity on 102 in that area, two through lanes in each direction, mm -hmm. uh, is plenty to accommodate that future growth across the bridge. The, the critical movements at that interchange are the turning movements, and uh, that's what DOT is uh, implementing. But what we've done is a test, and we've provided DOT with copies of the studies that we've completed uh, through February 6th, the full uh, development scheme to show that there are still global service D or better uh, at each of the movements at that interchange. What's level D? Uh, it's essentially uh, a measure of delay that uh, the average delay on any particular movement that would be roughly a minute or less of waiting at any particular signal. Do you have an idea of how much this is going to increase by percentage, what's currently there now? When you say 90 percent, exa for example, are going to use exit 4A and 50 percent and 75 percent, do you have a quantity? Uh? Yes. Um, all those were in the um, more expansive technical memoranda that we've supplied to staff mm -hmm. and to the peer review consultant. Um, very large document that was submitted originally. Okay. that quantifies between the no-build condition, you know, the case of general background growth without the PUD. Once we implement the PUD, so you can see how bad it would be without any mitigation at all, and then the condition where we mitigate traffic so that we can bring it back to be close to the condition uh, without the development in place. So it's, it's a measuring tool that we have with very expansive charts that show the comparative analysis of those various scenarios. Is it fair to say that you're not 
doing any mitigation around exit four because that's a state road and they're going to do they already have plans to do something uh, that is correct that there is a major transportation improvement project that is I-93 uh, that is planned regionally to accommodate growth so that is a, that is a fair statement uh, this is a process that as we've explained in prior briefing sessions that uh, this is the local process that we're going through at the zoning level with the PUD to understand what we have the right to come back to hopefully to propose something specific but above and beyond the town we also have the state process with DOT and with NHDES and others that also regulate all the different factors that we're talking about whether it's traffic and stormwater and others that is an additional level of review and control at a state level that are going to shape what we do specifically to accommodate traffic with any particular phase. Do you know if any of the plans uh, the state is using to modify exit four anticipated or took into account the Woodmont development and the additional traffic flow that is coming off of Woodmont? Uh, specifically, yes. no. But that's why we do this analysis okay. so they, they can see it. Okay, so they're still in the process of uh, developing plans to? Oh, no, they, they have their plans. They're advancing it. Mm -hmm. um, recently, the commissioner engaged a, a consultant to advance all the final design plans that stem off the preliminary process of design to finish all those things that have been set in motion. Okay. They have a very specific timetable, and, and John's received some of the documentation that talks about the phasing from the uh, DOT's I-93 project manager that outline all those steps and, and things that are on a, uh, a specific horizon by funding year, elements from ranging from exit three all the way up to the completion of 293. So these plans were done many years ago? It predates Woodmont. Predates Woodmont. So the effect Woodmont might have on exit four was not specifically taken into account on whatever they're going to do. No. Yeah, the, the regional models that were used, whether it's Southern New Hampshire, the consultant teams working for DOT all those years ago uh, during the environmental impact statement process, those things, those processes, those analyses all considered growth with that model that contemplates land use. Did it document specifically what we're proposing at this stage? Probably not. But it's, it's, that's the reason why we do supplemental analyses. And it's the same reason why we'll be back in front of the planning board with other traffic studies at each phase so that we can show how are we measuring up against what we projected in February of 2013 and <coughs> how do we test against that and what specific mitigation is necessary for those phases when they come up. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the state always uh, projects ahead and, uh, you know, looking back uh, in the 70s, 80s, even uh, probably like the early 90s, uh, the, the growth, especially Southern New Hampshire, exceeded what the state was uh, projecting. So uh, that's why the big building programs. Right. The so they, they could have projected at 5% or 10%, and now because of this, they're going to get 20%. That's, you know, that's my concern. Yeah, that's, that's Anec anecdotally, the there are a number of areas that have actually seen negative growth over the past five years, as you can imagine, with the, uh, the recession. So. Um, when we look at transportation models, we try to be conservative and yet still show something uh, either between half a percent and a percent for the purposes of what we've talked about with staff and HSH. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Anyone from the uh, public uh, have any questions or comments in regards to the, the water that we just have uh, been presented, the uh, sewer and uh, drainage, and then the, uh, the traffic as we had just discussed? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay, Jack. Didn't look like you were right. Uh, got your hand up there fully. But come down to the microphone and uh, name and address, please. Jack Falvey, 22 Cortland. I'm having trouble with the numbers. It looks as if that Woodmont wants to develop 1,450 dwellings. And it seems that if you look at the kinds of dwellings they intend to develop, it might 
resembles something along the lines of what Century Village is, as far as the kinds are concerned. Those are some of them. So a walk through Century Village shows you that there's roughly two cars per dwelling, pretty consistent. So if you look at 1,450 dwellings, and you bring that up to times two, you're talking almost 3,000 automobiles inside this 600-acre spot. You're assuming everyone has an automobile uh, there. Am I correct? I'm saying if you, if you per, go per to a similar yeah. development inside Londonderry and you walk through Century Village and you count the number of cars and you count the number of units, it comes to, on average, two per unit in Londonderry. So you can't live in a, in a development like Century Village, which is very walkable, without an automobile. So roughly, we're talking, give or take, a few hundred cars. Somewhere around 3,000 vehicles in this 600-acre area. And people tend to drive the vehicles almost every day. So I see 3,000 vehicles in 600 in 600 acres, maybe going in and out once a day, and I see the increased numbers of trips being 36 here at this intersection, 62 at this intersection. So I'm not quite sure, Now I realize this comes down to trips and it's all very technical, but just from a layman's point of view, if you're putting 2,800 or 3,000 automobiles inside 600 acres, you're gonna park them there every night People are going to drive them, and all of a sudden you're looking at the impacts of an extra 30 seconds to get in and out at peak hours. I don't see the numbers lining up, so perhaps the traffic people can tell us okay. why is it there's thousands and thousands of cars that are not there now, that are going to be there at full build-out, and the impact on the town will be a few minutes, a few seconds here, a few seconds there, whatever. Um, so yep. it's a comment, and I think if the, tra the traffic people have the technical expertise, maybe they could reconcile those numbers for us. Right. So your numbers, their numbers, see how they relate. Correct. Okay. He's doing some ciphering here, but whether we have it right away or not, I don't know. Can, can you help us, please? Uh, <laughs> yes, through the chair. Um, uh, although there may be two cars per unit, um, uh, Mr. Falvey's... Uh, observations assume that everybody leaves their house at the same time. Um, so although there may be two cars per unit, in some cases we don't anticipate it to be that high in a mixed-use development such as what we're proposing. Uh, the tradition, all the numbers that we've put together are based on very sound nationally recognized data from the Institute of Transportation Engineers for uh, a wealth of data in each of the residential categories, whether it be single-family homes, uh, apartments and condos, uh, and on average, when you look at the average rates of what it generates, it's roughly about one trip per unit um, for a single-family home, and somewhere around 0.6 unit um, trips per unit for a condo, and that's so like one, just one, in very broad terms. Yeah. So it's not a direct correlation of cars, mm -hmm. because the the residents that live there could leave at various times of the day. So like one one trip is one car. Uh, is that, can we uh, no, that? Not necessarily, um, oh. it, but per unit. Like a single family home would normally be one trip generated in a morning peak hour, the commuter hour, and uh, uh, one in the evening peak hour. Condos and apartments are less. So it's, it's not a correlation to the number of cars directly for everybody that's bombing the street at the same time. It's not that bad. It's, it's based on Sunday, and, and Jane can confirm. Right. I think that. You know, part of the issue might be the difference between daily trips and peak hour trips. The numbers that we were talking about were the PM peak hour only. And if you count up the residential units and the office and the hotel and hospital and look at daily vehicle trips, the projection is more like 40 to 50,000 vehicle trips per day for the whole 650 acres. 
but the trips are distributed over time. There's only so many in the peak hour that we base the estimates on counts. And then they're going on all different routes and all different directions, so that the proportion of trips, say, on Hubby Road is a very small proportion of those peak hour trips. So, you know, traffic is moving through time and space, so um, it does disperse and the impacts disperse. Was it the formulas, equations, and everything that explain all of this, uh, how it's, you know, uh, spread out through the whole area? Correct. And, and so it's, it's all, all in the... It's all in the study, and you know, it's in a big, thick thing. <laughs> it's exactly. pretty excruciating detail, which I think is why they've got lucky me to decipher all of it that I've been carefully going through it, and uh, you know, really trying hard to be certain that the impacts that they looked at were accurate based on that land use program, which is the important thing, I think, to keep in mind, that those maximum trips reflect that same batch of land uses, and they reflect the analysis that was done that, that is the basis for the mitigation, which is the other important piece to keep in mind. And the other component, which we talked about in prior meetings, is those trips that stay within the project boundaries as well, uh, which you don't find in some of the other isolated projects, residential projects, because they have to leave their site to go to retail establishments or uh, to work. And, and as we've projected reasonably and conservatively in our mind, that uh, we've minimized that number of the assumption for those that stay within the project boundaries in order to provide a conservative estimate of those delays. Uh, Jack. Uh. Appreciate very much the um, expert numbers. We're talking 40 to 50,000 trips or, that are not in existence right now coming to Londonderry because of the Woodmont development. And so those are different numbers in a way than we see on the slides, which are 39 extra cars here, 60 extra cars there. So I appreciate very much 40 to 50,000 additional trips in Londonderry from that 600 acre um, development will have some impact and the question is what and, and what it's going to cost and what it's going to cost in time and effort and road structure. So appreciate the numbers. Yeah, we've got to figure out what that's going to feel to us, you know, that uh, are already, yeah. uh, already here. You know, yep. Thank you. Thank so you that's much. how we got to decipher that big, big book and uh, to explain it to uh, <laughs> us lay people. <laughs> Anyone else? <coughs> Mike. <coughs> Mike Speltz, 18 Sugar Plum Lane. Um, I want to begin by uh, complimenting the design team because, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I heard them <coughs> commit to uh, no increase in stormwater discharge from the project as a whole. Uh, did I get that right? That's the law. It's, it's typically required of all projects. No, what's required yeah, it's of all required. projects is that a site plan or a subdivision plan uh, meet that criterion. But what I heard you commit to was that when we get all of the site plans and all the subdivision plans done, the increase in, in there, it, there will not be an increase in discharge from these 600 acres. For the, for the, peak, in, uh, the peak will be attenuated to match the existing conditions. Similar to right. a site plan. Right, but but we're, we're talking about here about a 600-acre site plan, so That's to speak, true. for this particular That's problem. And, and, I, and that, I think, demonstrates the value of having a PUD because we, we normally look through a soda straw. We look at a single site, a single subdivision, and yes, each one of those meets the criterion of no increase in discharge. But, and I get back now to the key point that Lynn made, it's a two-prong uh, problem here. One is discharge, the other is volume. And you can have, especially as we get um, flashier rain events uh, over the future years, for whatever reason, uh, the people that are downstream, ask the folks down in Brookview Drive, are, are seeing the cumulative effects. So you can have each little site or subdivision not discharge anymore, but 
over time, if you have more and more impervious surface upstream, then, then the volume of water over time, not the rate per hour, which is what they have to hew to, but over time can increase and can, can lead to flooding. So whoever brought up the fact that uh, you know, Brookview's down at the end of the pipe uh, brought back a, a very good point. So when you look at the memorandum, it's at least the one that's posted on the, on the web, there are no numbers in it. <clears throat> so we're told we're going to you know, work with bioretention, but you know, how many square feet of impervious surface is that? How much square feet of bioretention will that take? And, and I have to say that you know, bioretention isn't going to do anything for chlorides. Chlorides are, are dissolved in water, so the water moves through, even if it, even if it uh, is just recharged into the aquifer, it just makes the groundwater salty, which is why Beaver Brook stays salty even in the summer. We've, we've dumped so much salt into the groundwater that as the stream is fed by groundwater in the dry months, it still stays salty, which is excuse me, what got us into trouble with the EPA and got us into this total maximum daily load. <coughs> we're not only sharing it with this new development, we're sharing it with a doubling in the surface area of I-93. So th there's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real challenge to figure out how, how we're going to do this. And, and I, I hope that this might be a wake-up call for the, for the town as a whole and probably for this board in particular to, to think about how to deal with a chloride management plan at the town level. It, it's the flaw that's in this TMDL. There's nobody really held account, accountable. Everybody is, you know, the folks in Derry, the folks at Salt I-93, us folks, the, the people that, that salt the Shaw's parking lot. <laughs> We're all contributing. Salt in your soft water uh, machine is, is contributing. So it, it's something that we need to look at. That's, and I, I just bring it up because it, it hasn't been brought up before, and, and we ought to bring it up. It, it isn't particular to this project. So I hope that when these additional numbers come in, we'll see a lot more detail the way we have in, in, in traffic on stormwater management. We certainly have the ability to predict because we have a land use plan and we have uh, models for all of the various buildings we want to put in, the amount of impervious surface. <coughs> With that amount of impervious surface, we can figure out what bioretention it needs to do the recharge uh, and to control the discharge. And I hope you will look at cumulative effects of the volume that we're retaining and, and how fast we're releasing it over time. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Anyone else? Ian. Um, Ann Champa, 28 Wedgwood. I was just going to ask Mike, um, would, would the um, the microbes and plant mitigation work in winter as well as they do in the warmer months? <laughs> if, uh, if, since well, he well, seems to... Yeah, uh, probably, the, you know, that's something Mike should be telling us, not, not, not you or you asking him. You probably should ask him ahead of time or something, or maybe uh, at, at, at some well, point. Well, then I'll but ask the people from uh, <clears throat> Woodmont then. Yeah, because uh, this is a, this is a hearing, so you talk to us. You know, this is not a, a three or four or five way conversation. So. Okay, um, to the people from uh, Woodmont, if anybody would like to answer that, since I'm not an expert and I'm reading this, and um, and that was one of my what, questions. What, what are you reading? Um, it because from? Um, Woodmont Commons now is usually um, just used for recreation during the winter. Now, when the you know the ground is frozen, there's snow on the ground. But during the winter in the future, uh, with full build-out, there'll be roads in full use, and, and they'll be salted. And I was wondering, um, what difference will, will that make to the environment, and will their mitigation actually work during the colder weather to the, the extent they would like it to? Well, uh, the intent is it's going to work year-round, but uh, I'll get the specific answer from Jeff yeah, Wilson, who's our, that level our environmentalist. Because yeah. I think what, what's, uh, what's in, in this is, is, uh, is general, so. Right, but that's a, I think that's detail. a valid question if it's going to be uh, workable during the winter, and you must have, you must know some background on the, the bio, what is it, the 
biofiltration units um, for the um, yeah, We're not that little detail yet. But well, this, this they is, talk about it in this. We're just talking about the general process, but. On page nine, it's on all it. about biofiltration. Yeah, if you get some information on it for us, Ian, that would be helpful also. Excuse me? If you have some information on No, I don't. It's just a question of mine because right now that, we'll get, that we'll whole get that area. Answer. We'll get the answer yeah. for you in writing back Th to you, okay? Thanks. I just want to know, I, yep. you know, it's just a question that I okay. thought of uh, since it's going to be such a distinct difference from what, you know, what happens there naturally now. Um, there's a, a picture on... I'm not sure what page about a water main going across 93. Um, what happens if 4A is not built? Will that water main still go across 93? Well, we will get into more of the utilities at the, the May meeting. Uh, what was provided was really a snapshot of the discussion to come. This is an overview of what we are having right now, so there's no, no detail to this. Well, so it shows the, 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 the water main going across in one of the diagrams. But, and we were discussing what happens if there's not a foray. It's something you can bring up at another meeting. That's fine. It's just something I had a question on. Goes on, on ash. There, there are various connections shown across 93. Um, I would much rather get into this level of information at the next hearing because there will be more information available to the board and the public. Yeah, we'll, we'll uh, the okay, I, I noticed yeah. there was two connections, one across where foray would be and one across Pillsbury Road. Slash the, street. the technical experts, Mr. Chair, will be available at the next okay. meeting. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. Um, I had a question about WC12 if um, 4A is not built. It said there'd be no retail um, or a hospital um, east of 93. Um, well, it seems like people who live there, there's approximately 350 or so residential units in that area would need some kind of service. Um, to make it walkable for them because I'm going to say market, bas market baskets a little distance away from WC12. So um, is that an accurate statement that there really wouldn't be retail in there? There must be some portion of it need to be retail for those residents in that area if it's residences and offices only. Mr. Chair, would you like me to respond directly? Yes, please. Um, uh, what I, I presented this here. evening, and, is, um, and we're happy to provide that other chart, as um, Mary suggested, the trip caps are essentially the driving factor in controlling the traffic situation. And as I, uh, if you can go to the, um, the conclusions, <clears throat> uh, what we state in the third bullet is that uh, retail, hotel, or hospital space could be developed in WC12 with an equivalent drop in the other office or residential uses. So essentially, that trip cap that was presented in the chart, mm -hmm. if that is really our measuring tool, there could be a mix in it. But in practicality, I don't anticipate a large amount of either retail or the other uses that we identified because it's not going to have all that pass by traffic that the other roadways would. So uh, we still need flexibility from a land use perspective, but that's why we developed those traffic trip caps um, to measure against. Yes. So there wouldn't be any moving of retail from one side of the highway to the other to accommodate that or anything else. Okay, it's all, it's all basis based on the trip generations. Correct. So okay. there's, there's an end anticipated cap for the board to measure against in the future. Okay. Um, I had a question about the findings on um, on Hovey Road. Um, I was listening to what Mr. Farida had to say. Um, and I had a question about the trip generation chart up there, um, specifically about Hovey Road. Now, um, I'm sure you could help me out here. Um, I see without exit 4A, um, 19. Um, in the morning and 28 in the afternoon, extra um, trips. And with 4A would be 9 and 13. Um, which, in which direction is that? 
Is that going north on Hovey or south on Hovey? Mr. Chair, that would be a combination of in and out. Yeah. Both. Both. But Hovey is part of the resi residential area also. That's on. There's no dispute. That's that's. Yeah. It, it's a combination of entering and exiting trips from the yeah. PUD during that PM peak hour or AM peak. But I'd, I'd like to know if you, you mean it was going to uh, south to exit four and then heading like north or south or going up Hovey Road to exit five um, and going north. It will be a combination of both movements. Yeah. Um, again, there will be 300 something residences north of Pillsbury and 17 intersections on Hovey. And those numbers seem low to me knowing the traffic that is generated now um, and versus what could be with that amount of development in there. It's my own personal feelings and and as a resident right in that area. Um, because I for one know people who live who would uh, live near the um, top of your development near the um, cemetery area who wouldn't go south to exit four to go north on 93. They'd, he they'd head north on Hovey Road to go to exit five. So there would be more trips going up through Hovey Road to the intersection with Hardy. I just want to make sure people understand what type of road Hovey is. It's a windy road up north of the project, um, north of um, Wedgwood, my road. It's a windy road. It was recently paved and I thank the town for that. Um, the southern section on Hovey Road was originally called Bitch Hill Road for a reason. It's very steep and in the winter it's hard to get up. No joke, I've gotten stuck there. So, um, I know we're trying to conserve the salt in town but <laughs> that's one road that really needs the salt or some kind of remediation in winter. So um, Hovey Road is not a typical you know, straight roadway. And I just want people to be aware of that. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Anyone else? Okay, we'll continue with section four. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. This is a tag team. My name is Tom Goodwin. I'm with Shook Kelly. I'm a principal in the firm, and I've been working with the Woodmont Commons team on the uh, PUD subdivision and site plan standards. And um, this is really an update on the presentation that we did at the last planning board meeting. Um, we have been working with the staff and with HSH on actually filling in the metrics. What we showed to you in the last meeting were really templates, and we have now filled in the blanks within those templates. So um, a developer that would be coming forward with a subdivision plan is going to need to follow the PUD site of the subdivision standards and regulations. A developer that is applying for a site plan approval for a build or a or for a building permit for single family and duplexes would need to follow the PUD site plan standards. So there are three components to the PUD regulations and standards. The first is governing the land use and open space. Uh, those apply to the entire PUD. Um, those were described in the March 27th meeting. Uh, and we updated the, the tables, the use tables and the, the development tables in the last meeting. The second portion of the standards apply to the PUD sub-area and type standards. Um, what you're going to see in the documents are composition principles and standards, subdivision standards, and site plan standards. The third are the detailed written standards, and those apply to the elements within Woodmont Commons, such as signage, lighting, landscaping, and parking. These will be discussed at a future meeting. 
So the principles and standards, which with each sub area, there are uh, two pages. The first page deals with the the standards that apply to that <laughs> sub area, and the second page has the composition rules, the principles and standards. And what we have looked at with with HSH are two sub areas, WC1 and WC5. So WC1 is a central sub area with residential, retail, commercial, and a mixed use of buildings. So similar to what we showed you in the last presentation, uh, a an example subdivision is shown. Uh, so that you can see how the, the PUD subdivision standards and regulations apply. These are, this is a look at the two cover pages that go along with each sub area. On the left, the, the um, sub area plans tell you what types of streets, what types of lots, what types of uses, et cetera, are allowed within the sub area. And on the left, there are general rules and standards for the composition of that sub area. So within WC1, um, the, the PUD uh, subdivision standards include streets, blocks, open space types, uh, similar to what we showed in the last presentation. What we have done in this section of it is actually looked at the street types that are within it and updated the, the tables that were shown at the last meeting with actual physical dimensions and requirements for those street types. So if you measure a boulevard within WC1, you can look at the boulevard that is checked on the left, look at the dimensions, and if that complies, then, then it is an applicable uh, street type to use within <coughs> WC1. The same thing goes for the open spaces. On the land use plan side of the equation, the land use plans will designate the, the open space types that will be located within WC1 and uh, the subdivision submittal will identify the type of open space. And in this case, it's pointing to a square and there is a corresponding standard that goes along with that that tells you what the rules are for that square. Block types within each subdivision are also identified and in this subdivision <coughs> example the block is identified as a village center block. Again within the standards the village center block is described including dimensions around the block. And as long as the submitted site plan uh, follows the rules with within this diagram, then it is an acceptable block within WC1. <coughs> so the PUD site plan standards uh, are applicable during the site plan approval process or uh, during the building permit process for the single family and duplex <coughs> houses. And they include lot types, uh, site plan is typically prepared or co done concurrently with the approval of a subdivision and the developer preparing a site plan would look at the, the composition principles and the building lot types within the standards to see what requirements they, they must follow. So again, now this is dealing at the site plan level, so within that approved subdivision, a, a small uh, to medium mixed use project is coming in, is identified in the site plan, and there are lot types and building type uh, requirements that go along with each submittal. These are just some of the other examples of what we have been working with HSH on to develop. So the next uh, 
sub-area that uh, we looked at was WC5, which is a perimeter sub-area. It's a, uh, essentially a single-family <coughs> zone that's along Gilcrest Road. This is what would be shown with, with notations on the land use plan for that section. And again, very similar to what you saw in WC1, there are sub-area standards and there are composition principles and standards that go along with, with that. Now, within this, you'll see a much limited palette on what types of roads, what block types, and what types of uses can be used within within WC-5. So again, with the WC-5 subdivision standards, uh, um, it, it controls the block types, uh, the street types uh, that are within each subdivision. So the street type that is shown right now is a secondary street, which is a two-way street. And again, the measure you'd use to look at at the subdivision level is a two-way street diagram that has been developed. The allowable uses uh, within this um, are controlled. Uh, now, um, <coughs> One of the things we do have within this subdivision is we have called for a, a, a perimeter buffer along Gilcrest Road. So that is shown on the land use plan. There are allowable block types that will be included within the standards. And then again, at the site plan level, there are building types and lot types, very similar to what we saw in WC1, that will be included within the standards that control uh, setbacks, heights, and other lot requirements. So within WC5, we have a single family detached house that is permitted. And what you would look at when a submittal comes in for the building permit process is there's a lot type with the setback requirements and there is a building type with all the requirements on the heights and other attributes of the building. And really uh, we're working with with staff and HSH to develop the rest of those standards uh, so this was an update just to give you an idea of where we're headed with it. Okay, and the information here is just example only. It's not. We're, we're, yeah. yeah, this is the this is the current draft, and we have actually worked on the dimensional standards and all that within this document. So, this is what you're going to see for all of the sub areas and for all the, all the lot types, all the building types, okay. so that you, when a submittal comes in, you can look <coughs> on the composition and standards pages to see if it's an allowed use what streets mm -hmm. are permitted, what block types you should use. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a, it's a palette uh, that, is, that is broken down by sub-areas. <coughs> okay. No no question. Question. No question. No question. Any questions? Okay. We'll do our staff first. Uh, Nothing right now. Okay, John. Nothing right now. Ted, uh, Jane, anything? Yeah, we uh, just want to mention that we did have a series of meetings with the uh, development team, um, and I think that we are uh, progressing uh, as far as putting together the standards. Uh, we did expand the templates for street types and for uh, building types and, and open space types, and um, we were sort of fleshing out the specific specifications for each different uh, street type, open space, and, uh, and building type. Um, so I think the sampling uh, that we're showing for very different districts, uh, WC1 versus WC5, is, is good because it's really sort of both ends of the spectrum. Uh, the key is going to be how you assemble the pieces, you know, the, you know, the combinations of streets with building and lot types with uh, the integration of open space um, and, uh, you know, all framed within this block um, is really going to be the key. And I would uh, point out at this point 
Uh, there's a lot of work to be done there. These are just samplings, and um, you know, it's, it's you know, I know that there's been a lot of discussion about village centers and traditional design and walkable mixed-use compact uh, communities. All the principles of TND, uh, but at this point, it's just as likely that you're going to get large format, large-scale commercial big-box type developments, which may be fine with the planning board, uh, but it's the type of thing that we need to look at. And, and, and be specific in terms of where that's uh, appropriate and where maybe it's not appropriate and calibrate the, the, the development standards accordingly. Um, because, you know, traditional design has everything to do with the, the width of the blocks, the width of the streets, uh, the footprints of the buildings, the placement of the parking, and those frontages, those areas between the blocks and the street, or the buildings and the streets, and how you know, how those areas are, you know, uh, accommodating the pedestrians or bicyclists or other modes of transportation besides the, the automobile. So we got a good start here. I think there's a lot of work left to be done as far as uh, putting together all the pieces. Thanks. I'll go through the board, then we'll go to the public. Uh, Rick? I'll say. I'll say. Tom. No, I have no question. Don. Oh, I'm sorry, no. Mary. Um, I just wondered, I, I know you do have a lot of work to do, but this is a very good beginning and it's it's helping us, I, well me specifically, um, envision more clearly what you have in mind for each of the different sub areas. But uh, where WC5 you say um, bike paths or routes do not exist along Gilcrest Road but will share the streets within the sub areas, traffic volumes and speeds will be low enough to permit both. Have you driven on Gilcrest Road? <laughs> I think what we meant to say is that Could you just start? Yeah, microphone, um, please. Yeah, I was uh, looking at that as well. Uh, the intention is to say we recognize that there are no bicycle lanes or an opportunity for bicycles on Gilcrest Road, and we're not. Uh, we're trying to make sure that we accommodate within the PUD opportunities for bicyclists because they're not available on Gilcrest Road. Okay. So we better think about in including that uh, within the, uh, the the network of uh, streets and sidewalks and paths within WC5. We, we'd like to include those, but that's not the best spot. On right, Gilcrest along Road. Gilcrest Road. Right. But, you know, I'm not going to live in your subdivision but I'd love to bike in your subdivision because the it's going to be gorgeous when it's done. But how do I get there if I can't access that through Gilcrest Road? I mean, do you know, I would hope that you would look at Gilcrest. Okay. Say we have this, you know, this we have other streets that we're going to um, move traffic towards so that we will, you know, lessen potentially the traffic on Gilcrest and maybe make that a little less dangerous than it is right now. I biked on that road. And you know, taking my life into my hands, um, but I'm here, so people were paying attention, and that was good. But you know, we're going to have more people, and the goal is to you know either we're we're paving a mile for another bike path, you know, up north. I mean, the the goal is to increase, decrease cars and increase pedestrian and and bicycle traffic. So let's see if we can do something. You know, with the we're, roads that we already have. We're certainly looking for that balance of connectivity to the rest of the community while being mindful of the fact that some of these areas are not conducive for the most safe places for these connections. Okay. And, and that's part of the challenge is coming up with a framework that can allow for smart decisions that come later. So you guys are building the tunnel under 102, right, or the bridge over? Which yeah, that's a state be. road. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, that's all. So just a question on the templates. I like the templates, but are they going to be included in the master plan? Yes, they are. Okay, they will be. So looking at some of the specifics uh, here, we have the two-way street one on page 24. It's talking, you know, pavement width 22 feet to 38 feet. I know we have some minimum town standards here. Is, would that be something we'd be expecting to see a waiver on when we get into that whole process yeah. if we're looking at deviating from town standards? That's right. Okay. Uh, on page 30, just an architectural question that I don't know the answer to. It talks to transparency and articulation when it's looking at the buildings. Uh, what, what is transparency and articulation? I suspect transparency is windows, but uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> that's, 
That's exactly, that's exactly right. It's the ability to see inside, particularly with uh, certain <coughs> kinds of buildings along streets where there's retail and other uses, it's really important that there be transparency. You can see what's going on inside. That's what makes uh, walkable, interesting streets for those kinds of uses. Uh, when you're looking at a residential, say, townhouse, then transparency into the, into the unit is a different matter, <laughs> right? That's what the... Okay, good. Articulation, Steve? No, yeah, and our articulation <coughs> is, um, is, is breaking up uh, uh, facades or buildings in such a way that there's some character and interest. So we will talk about, uh, well, a bay window is an articulation. Uh, it's making a, a flat wall far more interesting. And there are many architectural ways of doing that. Mm. But it, there's scaling elements to make things more human scale. Okay, great. Yeah, and I think like a monolith. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just wasn't familiar with the term. The, the layperson's definition of articulation, I once had a bank project where I was asked to put windows on the back side of the building to break up the blank appearance of the wall until I explained that that's where the vault was located. <laughs> <laughs> you see your money. You kind of did. And then they asked for a door. <laughs> Unlocked. Unlocked. <laughs> so swinging door. <laughs> but what we've done with, uh, like, uh, you know, CVS is they have just uh, like a fake window. So it's uh, I, I was educated during that process. Those are apparently called blind windows. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. They look like a window from five feet. You get closer, and it's like <laughs> it's, it's part of the building. <clears throat> and then my last question, it, it may come back to whatever, you know, touch what uh, Ted was talking about, but on page 34 and 35 where we're looking at uh, the building type and the lot type for the large format retail, we have a minimum lot size and we don't have any maximums and uh, I, I think we need to establish some type of maximum building size for those areas as well just so that we can have some better control over what's going in there. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, that's it. Good. Okay. Okay. Laura. I I don't have any questions right now. I, I appreciate the, the graphics. It's helpful to begin to put everything together in my mind. Sure. I'm, I'm not sure if it's the same question that Lynn just asked, but my my only thing that I saw in here, I'm, um, WC5, mm -hmm. when it says maximum height three-story building, you don't mean three actually live it three living floors, right? You mean 35 feet, i.e. two living floors, and then like a, a roof to the height of the attic? You, you know what I'm asking? We, we were paralleling uh, the standards that you have uh, for single family residences that the town has in those zones like across the street. So you would have um, 35 feet as you define it, and it's exactly the same. Okay, so typically you you'd have a house. Uh, uh, you would have some room up under the roof that would. Yeah, but we're not like talking. That. I mean, I'm sorry, maybe I just don't have a perspective of 35 feet, but John, maybe you could answer this. We're not talking like three living levels, right? It could be. It could be. Okay. That's exact. It could be a barn also. I mean, it's, you know, it's a standard across the street in that particular district. So. Okay, so that said, then, with that clarification, in WC5, mm -hmm. if you're trying to fit in with the existing neighborhoods that abut that area. I don't see a three-story building fitting in it along that stretch. I think I, where you're having a problem, though, Lisa, is again, across the street, the maximum building height is 35 feet. So I think if it said WC5 maximum building height would be 35 feet, you wouldn't even be thinking of that. Because again, technically, again, across the street, those could be a three-story family. Yeah. If you have an attic space, if you have an occupiable, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, if you have an occupiable attic that space up in the I'm top of the house, it would be allowed by current uh, regulations. Yeah. Okay. I just say I, I so aren't. So what you're telling me then is regular existing regulations are such that that would exist. Is that yeah. what you're telling me? Could, it could. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just just but you wouldn't, ability to envision. you know, you would probably have, it, it would be a, an attic, you know, apartment or an attic yeah, bedroom. Room from the top. Right. right. Peak the roof. Roof. Well, yeah. like, I mean, uh, that's like fine. the third story could be uh, like a peak roof, so you'd have, uh, you know, skylights. And just asking. Thanks. Okay. Maria. 
Uh, yeah, my only question is uh, on page 36, the building type, the dedicated office. Um, and I know we've talked about this at prior um, meetings. Um, the 50 feet we're talking about for mm -hmm. office building, I think we talked about that could be five stories. Did, did we talk about that? Uh, past that we I up to think, five story uh, that we just spoke about. I think that was more of a question. I don't know that we're really programming for that. I'm, okay, because I'm looking at like the character examples on page 37. Right. Mm -hmm. And when when you look at the character example, um, and you talk about articulation, that has to me has a lot of articulation to it. It's got a lot of, um, you know, highs and lows to it, and it doesn't look as gawky, I guess, of a building to me. Um, it, 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 that is that's one of the visions of a, of, of a type of look mm -hmm. for a 50 foot it's representative high yeah so right. um so 50 foot high it it would would could could be for a building for a commercial building for a commercial yeah. building okay. and the number of stories uh, uh, varies uh, quite a bit the rule of thumb for office buildings is that rule of thumb is for years has been 12 feet floor to what they call floor to floor mm -hmm. Uh, so at 50 feet, you get four floors at 48 feet. Right. Is it possible that someone could come up with a really cool scheme and somehow get a, a 10 foot floor to floor? The building would be the same height, uh, one way or the other. And the idea is that the requirements, the articulation, the scale, all of those things have to come with that package. Right. But just use a height rather than specifying, you know, floor heights. And, but that's kind of that's that's why when you see a four floor office building in 40 and 50 feet, those tend to go together. That's not to say it couldn't happen. Okay. You know. Uh, yeah, I, I bring it up only because I, I believe John, uh, I believe in prior meetings you were concerned about the look. You wanted to see examples of yeah. um, yes. of a 50 foot building, and now so I'm seeing this. Still trying to find a 50 foot building in Londonderry. I don't think there is. Neither do I. Is it one in Derry? Yes. Downtown. Uh, down well, maybe, maybe, maybe 40 feet. Maybe 40 feet. It's 40. It's 40. I think that the closest to 50 foot is, is uh, right there. Manchester. Mm. Right? I don't think it's but I would imagine you would be envisioning these office buildings in certain, yeah. I know, I know That's they're exactly allowable right. in certain places, it's like along 93, you know, certain. They're going to be in certain sub areas. It's not that's, going to be everywhere. It's that's exactly right. right. There's a total mix that you're allowed to have in, in the areas. There, there's a limitation on the number of locations and the building heights. Right. Uh, one of the things that that um, the idea of the introductory <coughs> pages that talk about how things can be composed. So, for example, when you're along the highway, then they can really talk about the right. highway and uh, and where that is. I think that and and that. But one of the questions that had come up is is the idea of actually having some pictures of some real live buildings that get built in so that we're not, you know, you don't look at a table. And it, it does it seem like a good, a, a good way of starting to think about this and communicate it. But right. Well, that's why when I, like I said, when I look at page 37 and I look at that small picture, that character example, I mean, I don't, I personally don't have a problem with a look like that in the right particular sub area, it, in the right location. Right. And, and so, you know, if, on that point, I would refer you back to the briefing document from last month and the table of available uses right. and for the dedicated office building category. Right. I didn't bring it with you. Me, but, but that's okay. I'd have it. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and I, so I can share right now that, mm -hmm. you know, you, what you would find is that it's allowable in WC1, WC2, and WC12. Okay. And not those interior areas where it wouldn't fit or wouldn't look right or would be right. imposing or okay. lack appropriate articulation. Right. And that and that was my rec that's my recollection from prior meeting. <laughs> I just uh, I just wanted to go over that well, I, now. I think it, you need so. to you need to clarify that it is allowed in WC one, which isn't along the highway per se. Right, it's so it's right. it's the busy right. village so area. We, we, those are the things we need to figure out as right. far as what's appropriate where. Right, and uh, it may be fine in WC one, but just be aware of that. But maybe not w, smack in WC the middle. WC two, you know, maybe high. perimeter of WC one yeah. type of thing. Yeah. Exactly, and that's where the the compositional rules are so important. It's not just okay, you can put these wherever you want, but the right. edges should be different in the center, uh, and how does that get assembled? Right. Uh, uh, we, we, we thought about it as like assembly instructions. I almost think about like inside going out. Yeah. You know, like how surrounded does that? Surrounded by ourselves. That's right. Okay. <laughs> okay. We've got ourselves surrounded. <laughs> okay. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just have one question. Uh, on the boulevard and the two-way street, 
Uh, both have a notation uh, on screen parking and bike lane configuration may vary. Would that change uh, the uh, diagrams you have for the rights of way? Because uh, they're not shown on this. Yeah, and it, it's, it's been a puzzle we've been working on because we recognize that there will be spots where you want on-street parking and ones that don't. And um, the challenge is that it starts to generate, well, what if it's not parking on one side and maybe it's the other side and two sides? And we started to generate lots and lots and lots of diagrams. So we're puzzling a little bit whether it's a note that says if you have a parking lane, it should be eight feet, for example. Uh, uh, as opposed, to we were getting to a point where we we're showing it got to be a lot, a lot of examples. So we're trying to get to the basic idea about it and then and then show the kind of the menu of things you could do. So. Okay, I, thank you. I think the, uh, if I can sort of add to what Steve just said, I think the right-of-way stays the same, that, that, but there's variable elements based on what the frontage is on that particular block. So if a boulevard is, is fronting a retail district or a mixed-use district, uh, you may have wider sidewalks, you may have formal tree planting pits, um, you may have sidewalk dining, you may have on-street parking. If the other side of that block is an open, like a park or backing up to residential areas, you may have more of a, a buffering effect where you have you know, groupings of trees, you may have a, 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 a shared use trail rather than a formal sidewalk because there's differences between you know, that side and the uses there and what you're trying to achieve in that frontage zone versus the other side. So there will be variable elements, but the right-of-way will stay the same. Okay, thank you. Uh, is something else, Sean? Yeah, I had, I had a couple of questions that I'm looking through. Um, page 26, block type neighborhood, you have um, a block dip and a block <coughs> length and uh, a maximum linear, linear foot perimeter. If I do your maxes, it's about four and a half plus acres, almost 4.6 acres. Um, one of the things I, I don't see on this is a maximum number of units that could be built on something that size. Is that something you intend to put on this? Yeah, the way, the way it would work is that then you go to, okay, it's time to uh, uh, subdivide or put a use on it. Then you can say, well, what are the lot types that you can put on it? Just in, in the same way you have today, perhaps with a single-family neighborhood, there's a half-acre requirement or quarter-acre requirement. So then you refer to, well, what are the lots that you can put on that? And so, for example, if you wanted to do a single-family detached homes within that, then you would go, uh, if you're in WC whatever, um, then you go to page 31 and say, well, how do the lots how big do the lots need to be? How big and small can they be? Because they don't get too small, they don't get too big. And where are the buildings and where are the setbacks that happen within it? So the block is, it sets up the, 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 um, uh, the, the area in which you start to put the parcels. But they might be able to be uh, a little variable, so they're not all exactly the same. Maybe some are, some are bigger and some are smaller. But they're within the, the lot sizes. So the minimum the lot size for, let's say, a single, we're using single-family homes on this particular block. The minimum lot size is 3,200 square feet. The minimum frontage width is 40 feet. So if the block is 500 feet long, then you'll get about 11 or 12 houses on that, on that block. On one side. On one side. And then on the so same 20, amount. 24 on the, it's house, uniform. It would be the same amount on the other 24 side. 24 houses on four and a half acres. Yeah. And if I look at the picture and the character example that you give, mm -hmm. On 31, mm -hmm. that's what it would look like. The bottom picture could look like. No, no, no. That's yeah, right. an example, right? So right. Could it's look a good like. example of 24 homes. That's what that street would look like. Unfortunately, it looks a lot like where I grew up in Lowell. And if you've been to Lowell, this is not really that attractive. And the problem with this type of density is that there's no parking. So the question that I have is, what's that structure in the back when I have? The, the property line and I have a, a building in the detached the bat, de, uh, detached piece of building is it a, what is that a garage back there yeah, yeah how do I get back there alley so I have an alley between the two buildings in and the a backyard. density that large but that that with that amount of density yeah 
Okay. As one scenario, yeah. The maximum scenario. It's yeah. a wonderful one. Okay, thank you. Probably a reminder, WC5 and probably also uh, along uh, the uh, Gilchrist and probably WC11 uh, along part of uh, uh, Hubby would be um, some uh, apple trees. I mean, it's not indicated right. in, in, in here, but we discussed that uh, before, but not to... Not to lose sight of it, or, mm -hmm. uh, because we want to keep at least those areas mm -hmm. with our apple tree heritage uh, and everything. Mm -hmm. And probably uh, building types, I would <coughs> probably meet with the Heritage Commission and get some input from them, uh, because that's their expertise. They tend to like uh, colonial buildings, peaked roofs, traditional New England. They're open to uh, other ideas also. And then the question I had, this is regards to uh, parking, because uh, it's on-street parking and everything, but with density, at what point are you going to need a parking garage or a parking facility? Is, is, is there like a formula to have that is determined and where it would be located, right with the proximity where, where it's needed anyway? Uh, as far as a parking garage uh, uh, goes, uh, if uh, you were, at, depending upon how development got clustered in WC1, WC2, <coughs> and WC12, where you get mixed use in a bunch of things, parking structures could occur, would not necessarily have to occur, depending. Uh, there's no necessity, uh, depending upon how it works, but if, if there were opportunities and advantages to com condense, compact the development, uh, is the advantage of more open space, for example, um, to do that, uh, there will be building standards I specifically for parking structures and how they get incorporated into development as a whole. So, so they could make it look like a uh, nice cow barn or something and it's a parking facility. That's right. <laughs> and it'll be articulated too, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> but yeah, but I think that, I think that yeah. we want to be paying a lot of attention to that. Well, uh, and actually, could occur. actually there were parking structures in the video that we showed in the last presentation and they were all located behind the buildings. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. So yeah. You either either hide them or camouflage them. Yeah. So this uh, still the continuity of the architecture and everything. Right. Yeah. Okay. Anyone from the public? With uh, Jack. You beat you in. <laughs> Jack Falvey, twenty-two Cortland. In. Um, in WC5, the pavement width, 22 to 38 feet, and if you look at the cross-section, you notice that there's parking on either side of that road. So the available space for cars to pass is 11 feet in each direction. The road opposite that, which is Cortland, is 48 feet wide pavement. So I don't know what the town standard is, but the density that you're putting in here um, along with on-street parking, 11-foot spaces. And then you figure out that these trees have leaves on them, but most of the time there's snow on these, on these areas, several months a year. So you look at the road width that's allowed, and perhaps Al could tell us how wide a fire engine is and how wide a school bus is. Yeah, because our uh, road width mm -hmm. is 28 feet. That's what's uh, right. required <coughs> yep. to accommodate the fire equipment and also the... Uh, uh, wing. Well, this, shows, oh. this shows 22 feet. If I recall, I think we asked about the school buses and going up and down the streets, and I think the response was the kids can walk to the corner and that the bus wouldn't be going down all the streets. Yeah. But the fire trucks go down all the streets. Well, they'd have to, yeah. yeah. yeah they'd have, have to. But, you, <coughs> but I'm saying, you know, this, these numbers get in here, and then this becomes a standard, and this is the new town standard for this area. So I bring that to your attention, that 22 feet um, doesn't match up with what it's against, which is 48 feet. And also, uh, safety as far as parking on either side and snow um, doesn't seem to fit. So perhaps the developer would like to address those subjects. Right, because we'll probably, well, we will get into that level of detail. Yeah. At some but the point. level of detail is right here, right now. Yeah, this, is, uh, this is not a supposition. This is what, this is what they have. In, uh, Okay, we see five. Yeah, the, okay. We'll take a close look at it, Jack. Okay, thank you. 
Anyone else? Mike. Okay. Mike Speltz, 18th Circuit Plum. Um, I couldn't figure out a good time to ask this question, so if I'm out of order, you can tell me. But <laughs> we don't have a site plan or subdivision plan, so therefore we can't make a regional impact determination if I understand the process correctly. There, there is a regional impact. I think it's been addressed with Southern New Hampshire Planning Commission already, and they're part of uh, this process also. Well, what I'm thinking about is is the, the town of Derry. I mean, can, could you summarize, or could the applicant summarize what their involvement has been and what the plan is to involve them? I know uh, George Sioris has been at one of our meetings, I think back in January, and they uh, keep in pretty close touch. So I know uh, I've communicated with George once in a while, and he knows much more than I do what the detail going on. So I would say that they're uh, very well informed. Okay, anyone else? Ian. Excuse me if I just have some um, uh, mixed questions here, but they're just questions I had. Um, the winter, will there be on-street parking in winter? Because I know Na Manchester, they have, uh, during snowstorms, have uh, winter snow alerts, and they don't allow parking on the streets. We, we do in town also. Right. So what happens to all the cars that are the, from the residents that are parked on the street? Um, during the winter, where do they go? I, I think it's probably under consideration, probably not at this point. Okay, um, I had another uh, question. Um, I noticed in the, the village center areas, there's um, on-street loading permitted, and um, I believe these are just two-lane roads. Um, I, I, I just like, um, I don't know much about it, so I was, this is a question, of, you know, of, on how things are usually done. Um, when they have uh, service trucks loading and unloading, do they have um, time restrictions during the day um, that they're allowed to do that, or are they allowed any time? And has it worked in development with uh, loading at various times during the day? And it's just a question I had about, in general, about um, um, on street loading in, instead of in back alleys. I think most businesses either do it like at night well, or later could at I night or. Well, hear what they have to say? Yeah, I, I think it's under, under consideration. I don't think they've got the, uh, that level of detail yet. It'll, it'll be coming. I have to say generally, I think um, being New England, there, there will be a circumstance where there may be a, a small corner shop, and so for them to have a loading dock in an alley may be too much. And uh, for larger buildings that have quite a bit of deliveries, it'll be a different circumstance. So we need to have an approach that looks at uh, 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 good, good, solid common sense solutions, but that there needs to be provision for loading spaces uh, uh, and thought about that in advance so that when site plans come to you, uh, there's guidance. Yeah, we got something to That's right. by. Um, I have also one question on what is defined as an encroachment. Would um, porches be an encroachment? Yes. They would be. Would yeah. they, po porches they be allowed? They can go into the front yard setback. Yeah. They can go yep. into the setback. So to a certain degree, yeah. yeah. Is yeah. there any maximum amount or anything? Yeah, I think it's, in, generally speaking, it would be like 10 feet from the sidewalk. Okay. It, would that be a proportion of, uh, is there any maximum proportion that they can go into that setback if you like have a, 10 foot setback and you'd have to set the building further back and then put the porch in front of it but there's a there is a a max there's a minimum setback from the sidewalk okay so, you have a porch or not. so the general setback may not be actually where the a building starts because the porch could right. intrude right. into there's, that area there's what's called a build to zone so okay. within that say 10 to 25 feet you can place the building and you can add those encroachments like a front porch mm -hmm. that could extend or bay windows yes, or something like right. that. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Some variations that. from you know, from block to block, create some variation you know from house to house. Right. Um, I, for interest, mm -hmm. I can right. understand yeah. that. Um, now we talked about office buildings, and um, we looked at some more uh, some pictures that were uh, more contemporary in nature, and um, and I know our 
you're on the uh, um, Heritage Commission and you just went through the McDonald's review on 28. Um, it's still in progress. <laughs> right, right, I know, with the swoosh and everything. But um, um, how is that going to be handled in Woodmont? Because we are looking at more contemporary buildings here with a lot of glass. And Would it be in the same way, or um, would they be at, looking for? At site plan level, it would be the same way. But I think the input here is to put a, a tone, because you, you don't want everything all the same anyway. You know, you want a little, little variety. and. Uh, you can see the difference between, you know, uh, like more the industrial area, that type of architecture versus, you know, kind of what we're looking for uh, for McDonald's. Right, but we're talking about office buildings and with the same WC1 or it WC1, could be what WC2, I think it's against 93, um, versus what's existing now, now with, with Market Basket. And I know that went through quite a design review to add the peak roof and everything else on that. But I was wondering how um, something as contemporary in nature can be um, passed through the Heritage Commission. Well, I think, uh, well, as I said, you know, I think it's really, you know, the input for the commission. You, you do want some variety because there's people that probably want a uh, more contemporary type house. It, it all depends where we locate it, uh, you know, like we do, do he, uh, here. There are contemporary, well, because basically you're, uh, your residential housing, we have no you know, say over. That's up to the individual who, uh, who builds it. But I think of something like this, you can set a tone. And then the, the detail they can, they can work at residential. But yes, when it comes to site plan, then uh, the architecture is, uh, you know, we have special regulations for the architecture. It can be what? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. We, we have special regulations for the architecture that cover, you know, commercial and industrial uh, usage and, uh, you know, mixed use also. Okay. Yeah. But as far as your own own house, we don't tell you how to design it or anything. Well, maybe in a small part you do, but well, you it has like to a, conform you somewhat. Kind of like a little flavor in the neighborhood or something. And that's usually what a, what a, a builder will, will look at, you know, because okay. they don't want a, anything like a sore thumb because it might not sell. <laughs> well, never know who might like it. Um, you, I, you had a, I had a question. Because even in my neighborhood, there's a few contemporaries. Mm -hmm. That's what people want. So. Whatever floats your boat, as they say. <laughs> um, looking back to when this plan was originally submitted, um, there was a, a streets plan. I can't remember the name of the, the document. It had an extensive um, listing of street, well, a, a lot of diagrams of street widths. Thank you very much. Is that still basically the same um, as what was presented now? Well, I think the, the, there were something like 36 different types of streets. Right. Th there was and that is being sort of boiled down into a handful of street types. Okay, but if we we're looking at those diagrams, the ones you finally end up with, they'd be very similar to those. Some of them would, some of them wouldn't. And there's the, the sort of, I, you know, I'm, I'm answering on behalf of the Woodmont team, but I, I basically we're, they're taking some of those types and they're assembling a different, you know, a different uh, hierarchy for this particular development. We, we boil it down. And there, there were very nice diagrams yeah. and large yeah. that you could yeah. easily read, yeah. see them and read. Well, the diagrams them. aren't done yet for the okay. use of the street types. Okay. Well, it, um, anyways, I'll take a look back. I, I did want to say one thing and we were talking about tonight um, that we're not going to see any five-story buildings in this plan. I Did I hear that or I didn't hear that? I don't think you heard that one way or the other. I think what we were talking about was a 50 foot height restriction in the areas where commer dedicated commercial office right. space was an allowable use. If the developer could get creative and put five stories within 50 feet, then I think you could see that. But it would be it would it would be the unusual circumstance where that was possible. Okay, thank you. I just I just want to reference that again streets plan because on that but that what did you call it again? The pallet. The pallet showed five story buildings in there. And um, um, they must have been used for illustration purposes only. But so they wouldn't be the norm. They'd be occasionally inserted. I, I don't recall that specifically, but I, I know that the height restriction would be what governs what could be built on the side of the street. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Anyone else? No. Uh, we will continue this to the 8th of May.
I'd like to make a motion that we continue this to the 8th of May. Second. 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 Second by John. <laughs> Uh, any discussion by the board? Uh, this is a continuation of, uh, you know, the uh, master plan. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say uh, nay. Abstentions show it's affirmative. And this public hearing is, is continued to May 8, 7 p.m. right here. This is the only official notice. Motion to adjourn. Oh, Second. I have a question first, Mr. Chairman. The, the, town count, uh, the town calendar on the website has a tentative meeting scheduled for uh, April 24th. I don't see a need for that meeting at this point in time, but I just want to confirm that. With the, the applicant is certainly not asking to be heard that evening at school vacation week, uh, first and foremost. Yeah. So it might be appropriate to remove it from the website? Great, thank you. Yes. I think uh, just, I mean, in fairness, I think it was a, a, an, a concept that was reserved well before we no. got into the detail I agree and it, it's just not necessary at this point in the sequence and interfering with vacation week it doesn't make any sense either okay. so there's no no meeting scheduled for the 24th <laughs> everyone's gonna enjoy their vacation uh, thank you any other business uh, if seen the weather so this Mary has a motion to adjourn to have a second 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 by John all those in favor of adjournment signify by saying aye aye, aye. we're adjourned Turn off your computers, everyone, please. And your monitor.